Hey everyone, uh, today we're going to be beginning our lecture on Judaism and we're going to be beginning our two-part series on giving kind of a surveyic knowledge of the religion of Judaism. And so as Judaism starts something different as well as we're transitioning away from the Eastern religions and now we're starting to transition to the Western religions. And I'll talk more about that here in just a few seconds. But first, I want to mention that Judaism as a world religion is quite unique in comparison to other religions that we will discuss uh, thus far in the class. Um, in fact, there's probably about seven things that make Judaism very unique in comparison to the other world religions that we have talked about thus far in the class and that we'll continue to talk about as well. And so why Judaism holds this special place within the five major world religions. So first thing is that Judaism is one of the smallest of the world religions that we will discuss in this course with around 14 to 16 million followers worldwide. I think that is a low number. I would say it's probably closer to around 20 million, um, if not 22 million, but um, that's what the official number is for Judaism according to the World Religion Database. Uh, if you think about that, how small Judaism is in comparison to the other major world religions that we have talked about thus far are in comparison to Christianity with 2 billion, Islam with 2 billion as well. Uh, in comparison, if you look at the population of Judaism, Judaism only accounts on the globe, the entire earth's population. Judaism only accounts for 0.002%. Point zero zero two percent of the globe. So it's very small, very small indeed. And if we were to rank uh, the world religions by their size and by the size of their followers, Judaism would rank number nine, just behind atheism or people who list none at number five, uh, Chinese folk religions around number six, Sikhism at seven, uh, Taoism or Taoism, depending on your pronunciation, at number eight. So Judaism is not one of the, is really, you know, eh, it's not part of the big five, but it gets listed as the big five, which we'll talk about here in just a second. Judaism is considered a major world religion, not because of its size of followers, but because of its diaspora onto the, the globe. So what do I mean by the word diaspora? Diaspora. Diaspora comes from the Greek word uh, meaning to, to scatter, like think about seeds, scattering or dispersing seeds onto the ground. That's what it's talking about, um, di diaspora. And, 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 and diaspora is used in sociology, anthropology, history um, as a very common term for mass uh, dispersion or mass uh, migration of people of a particular ethnic population from uh, from its indigenous territories due to an either internal conflict or uh, internal social forces or external social or climate forces. Um, so think about uh, the, uh, the one of the most famous of these diasporas outside of Judaism is the Irish diaspora uh, of the 19th century, which saw about around 40 percent of Ireland's population migrate to England, Scotland, and the United States due to the Great Potato Famine and the various economic collapses that occurred within the country in the eight, uh, 19th century. And so how that how large the Irish diaspora was is that it radically changed the dynamics of certain population centers. Uh, think in the UK, places like Liverpool or in Scotland, Glasgow, uh, that became hugely dominated by Irish descendants and Irish people, as well as here in the United States. Think of New York, think of Chicago, that have huge, massive Irish populations and the significance of that. And that's what we're talking about, diasporas. They're very important to study about. Uh, in the field of Judaism, this term, or really in the, the field of religious studies, to be to be more precise, uh, this term is specifically applied to the Jewish people and their history. So sometimes when we say diaspora, we're really just talking about one group, the Jews, in the field of religious studies. Uh, so that's why uh, uh, it's very important. It's an extremely important ter term. Um, and it's mainly because the Jewish people have suffered various periods of diaspora 
of why you know the two are synonymous is because there have been so many periods where the Jews have been forced to migrate from their homelands uh, and pretty much forcibly into exile and forcibly to be scattered across the globe. So you think of um, in 722 BCE when the Assyrian empires of the ancient period uh, came and conquered the Jews uh, and the ancient Israelites and destroyed the city of Samaria and scattering them. We have historical records. We have documentations. Even the biblical text preserves this tale of a drastic diaspora of Jewish populations. We also have another in 587, 586 BCE, depending on your calculations. But for us, we're going to say 586 BCE. Um, so 586 BCE, it was uh, another empire, the Babylonians, who came and had conquered the city of Jerusalem, destroying the first temple and exiling half of the population. Well, really a third of the population uh, to Babylon, to modern day Iraq, Iran. Um, those territories is where they might force migrated the Jewish people there. Um, you think of 70 CE. So now we're getting into the turn of the modern era. Well, not so much the modern era, but turning from BC to, to CE. Uh, so 70, 70 CE was when the Roman Empire destroyed Jerusalem again, destroyed the Second Temple for the last time and forcibly exiled many Jews into various areas, Arabia, Africa, uh, the Greek islands um, as well. Uh, 135 CE was at the end of the Bar Kokhba revolt um, against the Romans, which again, the Romans forced a diaspora of Jews across the globe. Uh, again, in 617 to 638 uh, CE, there's a series of conflicts with the Christian um, Roman Empire or the Byzantine as we call them. Uh, were a series of, of battles and revolts that led to more dispersion of people. 1099 uh, is famous for the Crusades, where Christian armies captured the city of Jerusalem and expelled all the Jews as well as Muslims from the territory of the Holy Land. Uh, 1182, now this is actually in now dispersions, within dispersions. And so 1182 is the famous uh, in, in France where uh, Jews were uh, forced to exile from Paris, from other big cities within, within France. 1290, uh, Jews being forced to exile away from London and from other big cities within England. Uh, and then 1306, another forced diaspora of Jews from France again. Uh, 1492, we'll talk about that year later. Of course, that's the famous year Christopher Columbus discovered the New World, but this is when Jews were forced to, die, to disperse from Portugal and then later, um, uh, about four years later from, uh, no, sorry, 1492 was from Spain, four years later uh, was from Portugal. Uh, and then throughout the period of World War II from 1932 until 1945, Jews were being forced to exile because of the rise of Nazism and anti-Semitism that it had experienced in World War II. Uh, and then from 1948 to 1973, uh, the last phase of Jewish diaspora, but this was from Arab countries and, and, and Arab populations that were in response to the establishment of the nation of Israel that we'll talk about at the end of the lecture. Um, so because of all this, because of all of what I said here, Judaism can be classified as a global religion. And so what do I mean by a global religion? We already kind of talked about that when we mentioned Buddhism. But a global religion is that followers of the religion can be found quite literally on every continent of the globe. Meaning that even though Jews have a very small number, 14 to 16 million, you can find small and significant Jewish populations throughout the globe. You'll find them in London, Paris, New York City, Miami, Los Angeles, Montreal, Toronto, Canada, uh, Mexico City, uh, San Pedro Sula in Central America, uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil, 
uh, Cape Town, South Africa, Moscow, Russia, Buku, uh, and uh, Azerbaijan in Central Asia, uh, Mumbai in India. Yeah, we don't think about Jews being in India, but there is a significant and old historic population of Jews in India. Uh, Hong Kong even, uh, and Sydney, Australia. So you can find Jews literally on every continent in the globe. So next, number three, Judaism as a religion and a culture is vitally important to understand and recognize because Judaism was vitally important to the development and understanding of Western civilizations as well as Western religions. Now, the term Western religions. We, we've talked about previously the Eastern religions, our Dharmaic religions. So we talked about Hinduism, Jainism, Sikhism, Buddhism. We talked about, uh, to some extent, very small extent, Zoroastrianism can be labeled as an Eastern religion, but sometimes it gets labeled as a Western religion because of parallelisms and um, things like that. Uh, we also talked about the, the, the religions of East Asia, in China specifically, so Taoism, Confucianism, uh, Shinto as well. Those are all Eastern religions. Now we're transitioning to Western religions. And so what do I mean by that? Western religions refer to religions that originated within Western cultures that are historically and culturally and theologically distinct from Eastern religions, from African religions, which in this course we won't have time to talk about. Mesoamerican religions, again, we won't have time to talk about those. Native American religions, we won't have time to talk about those. Uh, and ancient Persian religions, which is Zoroastrianism. Um, I kind of label it as Eastern religion, but it gets its own classification as Iranian or Persian religions, uh, as well as Polynesian religions like religions of, ancient, uh, of the ancient Hawaiians. Uh, we won't get to talk about those today, but those are the differences that Western religions are distinct. They're, they're Western side of the world, Western cultures, but don't be confused with distinctions of African cultures, Mesoamericans and Native Americans, things like that. For many uh, Western religions, Judaism is uh, uh, extremely important as is also another key term here to note. It is a mother religion, a mother religion. So we saw this term already with Hinduism, uh, but Judaism here is a mother religion for many Western religions. And what do I mean by that is that as a mother religion, we define it as a source of other world religions emerging out from. Uh, and so Judaism is a mother religion to other Western religions like Christianity, Islam, as well as other ones that we're not so familiar with, Rastafarianism, Druze, or Druze and the Baha faith, Mormonism as well could be classified as that, but that's, that's Christianity. All of these religions are also classified that we just talked about here, Christianity, Islam, Rastafarianism, Druizy, um, uh, Baha faith, though all of those religions are classified by scholars again in another subgroup known as Abrahamic religions. And Abrahamic religions refer to monotheistic faith traditions that venerate the God of Abraham. So Christianity, Islam are major Abrahamic religions, and that's what we're going to be speaking a lot of time on. Um, as another term, just really quick, what I mean by Western civilization as a term for definition, Western civilization is referring to heritage, customs, social norms, ethnic, val uh, not ethnic, ethical, excuse me, ethical values, beliefs, and political systems of the Western world. And Western civilization is strongly influenced by Greco-Roman culture of antiquity, uh, Germanic cultures of the M Middle Ages and Medieval period, um, as well as Judaic Christian culture as well. So much of the great art of Western civilization, of the Renaissance, much of the music of the humanist period, much of the philosophy of the enlightenment period was all influenced at some root, at some level 
by Judaism. So if you think about it, half of Rembrandt's famous Dutch painter from the 16th, 17th century, the famous Rembrandt, half of his paintings are all depictions of the Hebrew Bible, of the Jewish Bible. If you think about it, half of the music that developed from the 18th century, this is the 1700s, are all about characters from the Hebrew Bible. Musical uh, notes about Samson and Delilah, David and Bathsheba, uh, Deborah, the prophetess Deborah, or about Joseph, not the father of Jesus, but Joseph, the son of Jacob from Genesis. As well as some of the great philosophers of the period. So you think about it, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, the famous Dutch, no, Danish, sorry, famous Danish philosopher. Uh, much of his philosophical writings in his discourse have to deal with the Hebrew Bible. Karl Marx, much of his thoughts on communism is directly influenced from the Old Testament as well. Karl Marx was a Jew. So, because of this unique relationship of Western civilization, it's essential to have an understanding of Judaism and why it gets lumped in with the major five world religions because of its significance. Not so much of its size, but of its significance. Number four, Judaism is unique among the Western religions in that it's an ethno religion and a very unique one of that. So we've kind of already talked about ethno-religions when we got to Hinduism and Jainism and Sikhism. To uh, some extent, we talked about it a little bit with Buddhism, saying Buddhism is not an ethno-religion, um, even though we tend to think of it as, as only Asians um, in our minds uh, and our uh, stereotypes are Buddhists. But, um, but anyhow, within Judaism, Judaism is an ethno-religion. Um, Ethno-religions, if you remember, refers to a group unified and defined by their common ethnicity as well as their religious background. So it's those two things that define them as a people group, not only their ethnicity, ethnicity but also their religion. So think about Sikhs. Sikhs are particular. They can, uh, over 98% of all Sikhs come from one small region within India. Um, as well as modern day Pakistan, the Punjab, Punjab region of India or Pakistan. And so that's a good example that um, Sikhs are you know, overwhelmingly from this region, have this dialect, are from this ethnicity. But however, they're different. If you remember when we talked about Sikhism is because, again, not all people from Punjab are Sikhs. There are Muslims, there are Hindis that don't identify as Sikhs. So that's where it's a hybrid ethno-religion. Same thing with Jainism. We talked about it. it's really an hybrid religion. Here's our first true ethno-religion. And so ethno-religions, um, like Judaism, why it's completely different is because for Judaism, their religiosity is part of their identity as well as their ethnicity. And vice versa as well, meaning that a Jew can religiously not be a Jew, but still ethnically be a Jew, or a Jew can be ethnically not a Jew, but religiously a Jew. So it's this weird hybrid hybridization that goes on with um, this ethno religion, which makes it very unique and, dif and different from all the others. But primarily it is tied to its ethnicity. So rarely do you meet people who are not ethnically Jewish who are a part of their religion of Judaism. Um, there are some other ethno-religions, true ethno-religions like the Samaritans, like the Yazidi, to some extent the Copts of Egypt, but that's a little bit different. Number five, unlike Christianity and Islam, Judaism emerged out of uh, or sorry, let me rephrase that. Unlike Christianity and Islam, Judaism is not a missionary religion. It is not a proselytizing religion. So this is where it's unlike Buddhism that we have discussed so far. The term missionary religion 
is a categorization used by sociologists, by religious scholars, to describe religious groups that grow their ranks through proselytization, as opposed to primarily growing through birth and marriage, aka their ethnicity. Proselytization, uh, as a definition, refers to the conscious attempts to convert someone to your own religion or beliefs or opinions. So you proselytize, you're trying to convert them over to your way of thinking. Now, Christianity and Islam do grow their faith community through birth rates primarily today and marriage rates primarily today. But however, these religions are still primarily missionary religions or proselytizing religions. That's still the way that these religions have grow and they continue to grow today, but more so it's through birth rate more than anything now as missionary efforts have significantly slowed down. But the reason we give this categorization to Islam and Christianity still today is because not all Muslims are Arabs. Not all Christians are white. In fact, both of those uh, ethnicities are, in fact, significant minorities within each religion, even though they're somewhat the birth of these faiths, um, less so with whites, but still it's really, you know, it becomes a Greek um, tradition, so white tradition for Christianity. Uh, Muslims, you know, Arabs populations are only around 20% of all Muslims are Arab. For Christianity, it's around 30%, if not 40%, and going down every year. Judaism, on the other hand, Judaism, by its nature and its traditions, is not a proselytizing religion. In fact, there is rabbinical literature that discourages Jews from actually proselytizing their faith to other people. And, 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 they're actually encouraged to to turn away non-Jews which in rabbinical terms or in Hebrew non-Jews are referred to as goyim goyim g-o-y-i-m goyim non-Jews or Gentiles is the other term that you might hear from the New Testament in Christian language but goyim uh, the non-Jews and but But still, to be fair, there are traditions and procedures within the faith of Judaism for how people can convert to Judaism, but conversion is really rare outside of marriage. Marriage is where it mostly happens within the field, uh, within the realm of Judaism. So many religious scholars and sociologists instead would describe Judaism as an ideogramus religion, ideogramus, so meaning... uh, Indiogamy. So Indiogamy, which is E N D O G A M. Indiogamy. Indiogamy is just a basic word that means marriage within, exclusively within one's race. So if you're white, you typically marry white people. Blacks, you typically marry black people. Uh, you know, brown, yellow, whatever you want to say, they typically are those ways. But for Judaism, it's very strict in that it's also tied not only to your ethnicity, but it can also be tied to your social standing. So somebody who's rich typically marries somebody else who's rich. Rarely do they marry someone who's poor and vice versa, unless you're very good looking, (laughs) the exception. Um, But also with ideogrammies, it's also re- married within your religion. So Protestants marry Protestants, uh, Muslims marry Muslims, Jews marry Jews. And so that's really what Judaism is and how it's defined as a religion on the world stage is that it doesn't grow through proselytization. It really grows through marriage and birth rates. So that's something very different than what we'll see with Christianity and Judaism, something we saw differently from Buddhism. Uh, Number six, Judaism is unique as a world religion because of its history and because of its status within world history. And why Judaism gets all of this attention? Because its history is, is absolutely fascinating as well as heartbreaking. For nearly all of its existence as a people and as a religion, Judaism has always been 
almost always have been a minority religion and a persecuted religion, meaning that they have never been the majority of believers within a specific region or country that they happen to inherit. They've always, for much of their history, have been the minority and thus have always been a persecuted religion. Those two things, minority and persecuted, have had a significant effect on the religious and cultural developments within the religion that we must acknowledge as well as we must take account of. It's particularly in the field of religion because it, it, Judaism develops differently because of this status. So very quickly, what do I mean by minority religion? So as a term, minority religion, quote, refers to the religions whose population and cultural status are not in the majority. So that's what you need to know, remember for definition here. Minority religion refers to religions whose population and cultural status are not in the majority. Persecuted religions refer to systematic mistreatment of a religious group because of their religious beliefs and affiliations. So that's what we mean by persecuted religions, what we mean by minority religions. So what this means is that the changes that we see within a religion and its culture, particularly for Judaism, but more so anything that's labeled a minority religion or a persecuted religion, that the changes that occur within these religions are always reactions and reactions to what we call in sociology social forces or external social forces, meaning that a religion and a culture develops and evolves out of a reaction to their status and treatment as a people and as a religion. And so that's what you'll see with Judaism. Judaism develops and emerges out of reaction to things. And we'll talk about that. But when we get to Christianity and we get to Islam, similar to Buddhism, it's, it's, it's not reacting to changes from external social forces, so to speak, but rather internal divisions. Like we saw within Buddhism, that Buddhism developed and evolved within itself and, and you know, um, emerged new different traditions and streams of thought, not because of external forces, because of armies, because of their mistreatment within these countries, but because of internal differences. The Buddhist councils that we talked about are migrating to new populations and territories and having to come up with new ways of thinking um, as well. For Judaism, it's quite different. It's mainly because of persecution. The ancient Greeks and the ancient Egyptians where Jews have lived in the past uh, have persecuted the Jews because the Jews didn't accept their cultures or adapt to their cultures when living in their lands and didn't fully participate in their societies. The Jews would not attend Egyptians or Greek festivals because the meat that was provided during the festival was often sacrificed to the gods when slaughtering. So the meat was being offered, uh, which is a no-no for Jews, offered to other gods before consumption. Or males wouldn't participate in Greek gymnasiums, often because participants in those gymnasiums perform their activities in the nude. They'd be stripped down naked. And so when a Jew strips down naked or a male Jew particularly strips down naked, um, there's a significant difference between the two penises. A Greek penis would not be circumcised. A Jew would. Within Greek culture, circumcision was a huge no-no. You did not perform circumcision on a male body because that was seen as barbaric, as seen as... Um, uh, uh, mistreatment seen as um, abuse, really child abuse too. how they would write about it. If we were to put it in modern terms, that's how they would write about um, performing circumcision on children. The Greeks really significantly did not approve of circumcision. So the side note here, there was times in the, um, in the first century, first, second, third centuries BCE, 
that when the Greeks started conquering the world and the Jews wanted to get access to Greek culture because if accessing Greek culture meant improving your status, uh, Jewish men would often go have reverse surgeries to get their penises uncircumcised, even back then. So that's impressive. Um, the ancient Romans persecuted the Jews because of their religious beliefs, particularly their beliefs about the Messiah and messianic expectations. The Romans saw those religious beliefs as prompting harmful Jewish nationalism, which led to several Jewish revolts within the Romans. So if the Romans theorized that if we can get rid of some aspects of their religion, AKA messianic beliefs, then the Jews would stop rebelling against us because they would not have Jewish nationalism. They would just accept Roman rule and hegemony. Christians and Muslims later on would persecute Jews because of their religious beliefs, because of their refusal to acknowledge Jesus and the prophet Muhammad as prophets of the same meek as Moses. So again, because of this status, as a minority religion, Judaism developed strong theologies and traditions aimed at preserving their culture, preserving their identity, preserving their religion in the face of obscurity, while manifesting beliefs of hope, redemption, and restoration of the Jewish people. So again, this is why this is an important detail about the Jewish people, because no other religion really has these types of ties within it. A little bit Zoroastrianism and Mormonism, but n nothing as to the scale of Judaism. So this is why it's very important because of its status within world history. Uh, and finally, number seven, uh, Judaism is really re unique as a world religion in that depending on who you ask, some would classify Judaism as a founder religion founded through the prophet Moses or later rabbis that it's really the rabbis who founded Judaism, what we would think as Judaism. However, others would say, no, it's very similar to what we've already talked about with Hinduism, meaning that its origin is largely indeterminate. We really don't know the true origins of Judaism and that Judaism is really a synthesization of various other religious traditions within the area, which is also true. That we, if we were having a lecture just dedicated on the field of Judaism, I could show you, um, even inside the Bible itself, you'll see other religious traditions throughout the Old Testament. You'll see an acknowledgement of ancient Near Eastern religions, Babylonian religions, more so the religion of the ancient Canaanites, um, that we see from major cities like Ugarit or Jericho. Um, Jericho mentioned in the Bible is a significant place. These texts that speak of the religion of the Canaanites, we see that also fully displayed in the Hebrew Bible and how the Jews operate their religion. It operates very much the same way. So again, it's possible that there's this centralization, um, but we really don't know. So again, some religious scholars and historians would classify Judaism as a founder religion, pointing to Moses, pointing to the reception of the law at Mount Sinai as that founder religion in the same vein as Islam with the prophet Muhammad. And after all, it would make sense, make 100% uh, sense to claim that Moses is a, the founder of the religion of Judaism, that Judaism is a founder religion, because after all, Within Jewish traditions, Moses is the author of the most sacred portions of the Hebrew Bible, the Torah. That's traditionally thought who is the author of these stories. Moses is the person who institutes the earliest and beginnings of the Jewish religious practices and traditions and celebrations. He's the one who sets when they're supposed to celebrate Passover, Yom Kippur, um, Sukkot, all the other major uh, Jewish traditions that are mentioned in the Hebrew Bible or the Torah. Uh, the roles of the priests and how sacrifices are to be built. The dimensions of the temple that once it gets built later on by King Solomon, the dimensions come from Moses. So it's true that you could say 
it is a founder religion. However, it's also true that you can say it's a synthesization of other religions, the religions of the ancient Israelites, the ancient Canaanites that merge into one religion that we as scholars call and recognize as Judaism. However, um, for our purposes here, we're going to take the tradition. We're going to take the traditional row. We're not going to dive deep into all of those things uh, because it's very nuanced. And if we did a similar, uh, we would have to do just a dedicated study, a dedicated lecture on just the origins of Judaism to really nail it down um, and to really see that it's probably more a synthesized religion than a founder religion. But for our purposes here, we're going to side with founder religions to go with the tradition. So, that's some of the basic facts about Judaism. Now let's transition to our next section here about Judaism, which makes Judaism extremely unique among all of the major world religions that we have talked about thus far, is that Judaism is a religion of story. Judaism as a religion, as a culture, and as identity uh, can be summarized and be stilled into a singular phrase that we'll also see later on when we get to Islam, people of the book. It is true. It is the true heart of this religious tradition that Judaism can center around the stories found in a book and one singular book as well, the Hebrew Bible. This book is, as I said, known as the Hebrew Bible, um, but it's not to be confused with the Christian Bible or the Christian termination of Old Testament. No, we don't use those terms here in religious studies or when we talk about Judaism because we, we talk about the Hebrew Bible. So you might think of yourselves and say, oh, it's synonymous to think of Old Testament and Hebrew Bible. To be honest, that is true, but in reality, they're actually two different books. And I'll explain why I say that they're two different books, because of their editing and how they're organized. They are organized differently. Jews organize the Hebrew Bible significantly different than how Christians organize the Old Testament. And so that's why we say they're not the same and that you should treat them as two separate books. So the Hebrew Bible is the Bible of the Jews. And then there's the Old Testament that Christians have taken parts of Jewish traditions and have made it their own. So they're two separate books. OK, so I just wanted to stress that uh, the Hebrew Bible. So we're going to use that term. The Hebrew Bible is a collection of various Hebrew as well as Aramaic manuscripts. So that's the, the other language of the Jewish people after the biblical period. They start speaking in Aramaic because of the Babylonian invasion, the Persian invasion and conquest and the creations of the Babylonian Empire, as well as the Persian Empire had left a new way of speaking, a new dialect upon the Jewish people in the ancient times, and which was very similar to Hebrew, but significant changes. Um, so they started speaking Aramaic and their language became that of Aramaic. So there's some biblical manuscripts that are Aramaic, but anyhow, so the Hebrew Bible is a collection of various Hebrew and Aramaic trans uh, manuscripts and genres of literature written by various authors dating between the year 1200 BCE to 167 BCE. The Hebrew Bible for the Jews consists of 24 books, as opposed to the 39 books of the Protestant Old Testament Bible. So again, that's why they're different. They arrange them significantly different. And Protest uh, uh, Christians typically have more books than those of the Hebrews. So the Hebrews, the Hebrew Bible consists of 24 books in a collection. The Protestant book consists of 39 books that are the Old Testament. Catholics, their Old Testament consists of 46 books. So they add even more that Protestants don't add. Um, and Orthodox Christians add more books. Their Old Testament consists of 52 books and some 56. So this is why we don't use the term Old Testament to describe the Hebrew Bible. 
because there are differences. Uh, furthermore, I, I need to stress that the Hebrew Bible, even though I said that it's a singular book, it really isn't a singular text, meaning that it doesn't have a singular author. Uh, it is not like the Harry Potter collection, that it's various books, eight, what, eight books, eight, nine books um, written by a singular author. No, the Hebrew Bible is a collection of books written by various authors using various literary genres and edited over time to form a collective narrative. Thus, the Hebrew Bible is better to be described as an anthology, meaning a collection of edited writings, edited writings by various authors. And I also need to stress here that the Hebrew Bible was not written by divine beings, even though traditionally it says it is. Rather, it's written by human authors. The Jewish tradition confirms this. Later, Christian thinkers would make the same claims as well for their apologetic purposes. So we need to make sure and recognize that the Bible is not written by God. It's written by men. Edited works of literature as well. Uh, within, the Ju within Judaism, the Hebrew Bible is also known by another name. Tanakh, Tanakh, which is an acronym for an abbreviation of the three-part division of the Hebrew Bible, that of the Torah, of the Nevi'im, and the Kithuvim, all Hebrew words. Uh, within Judaism itself, so this is what's, you know, sometimes you'll hear the Bible called the Tanakh, but more so within scholarship, religious scholarship, but within Judaism itself, they use another term. Uh, to describe the Hebrew Bible, the Mikra, Mikra, uh, M I K, no, sorry, M I Q R A, Mikra, which is used for the Hebrew Bible, which means in Hebrew of that which is read. So they would say the Mikra, scholars would say the Tanakh, but you'll also see that in um, rabbinical writings as well. Um, but the Hebrew Bible is sufficient enough. So let me real quick break down these divisions here. So the Tanakh is the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Kithuvim. So the Torah, T, Torah, stands, has two different meanings within the field of Judaism. However, it's more universally understood as meaning the law or the instructions or the teachings. But Torah can also refer to a compilation of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Genesis, which in Judaism is known as Bereshit, um, as the first word of the book of Genesis, Bereshit, Bara Elohim. Bereshit is where the title gets its word. Bereshit meaning in the beginning. Exodus is the second book of the Torah. That's how Christians or scholars refer to it. But the Hebrew word is Shemot. Shemot, which means the names. Uh, Leviticus, uh, Wakiar, which is, and he called in Hebrew. Uh, numbers, um, Bidabar, which is in the desert. And the fifth book being Deuteronomy, which in Hebrew is Davaram, which means the words, the words of Moses typically, but they just shorten it to Devaram. Uh, colloquially, you can see that the Torah is also described as the book of Moses within traditional Jewish traditions because it is Moses who is believed to be the author of these materials. So you'll also see here people say the book of Moses or the law of Moses. Uh, again, within Jewish circles, you'll also see the word uh, kumash, kumash, C-H-U-M-A-S-H, kumash, which in Hebrew just means one-fifth or just five out of you, you would say as well so the five books um, within Christian and academic circles the Torah is also called the Pentateuch the Pentateuch uh, which is a Greek word that means five scrolls or five books um, and then also within Christian and Islamic sources the word Torah can sometimes refer to the entire Hebrew Bible as well. So it's sometimes confusing of what it can mean, but primarily it means the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, 
Torah can also refer to the teachings or instructions of God through the prophet Moses or through the prophets in general sometimes as well. It is teaching within Judaism. Um, and as the, the, in Jew, Jewish tradition, this teaching is eternal. It's from God, not the Bible, but the words are the teachings. And the teachings have a very specific name as well within Judaism known as Halakha. Uh, Halakha, H-A-L-A-K-H-A-H. Or sometimes there's no H at the end, Halakha. But I, I leave the H at the end because it's there written in script, written in the writing, but not pronounced. But anyhow, we'll come back to Halakha later on in this lecture. But I just wanted to talk about that, the T for Torah and the Tanakh. What does it mean? The next section is the Nivi'im, the Nivi'im, the N, the Nivi'im, which literally means in Hebrew, uh, the babbling ones. So it's my, one of my favorite words in Hebrew, the babbling ones, or the ones who bubble over. Uh, but universally is translated as referring to the prophets. So it's a term that refers to the prophets. But if you think about it, prophets are people who just babble on. They babble over. They talk a lot. So it's the people who talk a lot. Prophets. First, it's important for us to talk about the prophets. Uh, within many religious traditions, a prophet or a prophetess, the female prophet, uh, is an individual who is regarded as being in contact with divine beings and act as intercessories between humans and the divine, typically speaking on behalf of the divine. Uh, and these prophets and prophetess are usually operate outside of indigenous cultic systems or traditional systems. They operate um, alongside of it. They don't consist within it. So the prophets usually exist outside of the priestly class, but they're recognized as being part of it, sometimes regrettably, as if you read the Hebrew Bible. Uh, prophetic individuals play a significant role within Abrahamic religions and as well as many of the founder religions. Uh, within Judaism, prophets act as uh, intercessories or intermediaries between God and the Jewish people. But more specifically in the Hebrew Bible, the prophets act as an intermediary between the Jewish monarch and the Jewish priest with God. They often provide prophecies and prophecies are messages from the divine about um, the future, which are sometimes known as oracles, or that just merely to make the will of the gods known. So to the ancient Jewish people, um, prophetic gestures were also performed as well, which these pro pro prophetic gestures serve to illustrate messages from the gods in physical manifestations. So uh, miracles are prophetic gestures, odd behaviors. So example, like the prophet Ezekiel, that he publicly in the book of Ezekiel lays on his side for 268 days straight on his right side. And then he f gets up and lays on his left side for another 60 or 100 days in order to prove a point, a metaphorical point. So that's a prophetic gesture, odd behavior, strange deeds. So those are the prophets. The, 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 uh, now let's talk about the books themselves, the Nivim. The Nivim consists of eight books within the Hebrew Bible, and they're subdivided even further. So within the Hebrew Bible, there is what is known as the narrative prophets or the Nivim Roshaim, uh, which means in Hebrew, the former prophets. And the former prophets or the narrative prophets provide historical narratives concerning the history of the ancient Jewish people and the actions and deeds of the prophets. There's only four books that are within this section, the Nevi'im Roshayim, which is uh, the book of Joshua, the book of Judges, the book of Samuel, and the book of Kings. Now, here's a difference. In Christianity, Samuel and Kings are divided into two divisions, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and they're read as separate books and treated as separate books. Within Judaism, they're one book and they're treated as one book and read as one book. So that's something that's a little bit different. 
So there is the Nevi'im Roshaim, the narrative prophets. The other division, the other subdivision are the speaking prophets or the Nevi'im Akharonim, which means the latter prophets. Uh, and what the speaking prophets, why they're different is they give very little narratives, very little history about what's going on with the Jewish people or the actions and deeds of the prophet. Instead, what th these books do is they focus on oracles and prophetic predictions and, pr and prophetic sermons given on instead. So there's no biographical details about these individuals or the historical circumstances that are going on. It's just a preservation of sermons, a preservation of oracles. Uh, so there's only four books that comprise this section. Um, the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Shanim Ashar in Hebrew, or what we would say in English, the book of the Twelve. Um, in Christianity, this book is divided into 12 individual books known as the minor prophets. So the, you know, the book of Joel, Jonah, um, Malachi, uh, Zephaniah, Obadiah, Nahum, they all get divided into individual books, but for Judaism, they're all one book and they're all to be read as one prophecy versus others. So that's a small difference. So that's the Nivi'im. The last section and the final section of the Tanakh is the Kituvim. The Kituvim in Hebrew means simply writings. And it refers to 11 book collection of various different types of literary genre. And like the Nivi'im, the Kituvim is subdivided into sections as well. The, uh, the first section is the Sefari Emet in Hebrew, which means just poetic writings or wisdom writings. So this would be the books of Psalms, Proverbs, as well as the book of Job are subdivided into this section. This next section is the Chamesh Megilot, which means five scrolls in Hebrew. And it refers to the five books that are read and recited during special religious festivals. So the book of Ruth. Ecclesiastes, Esther's, Lamentations, Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, depending on your English translations. And then the third are just other writings. They don't have a special Hebrew word for this. They're just uh, other writings is what they typically get labeled. And so these are the last of the manuscripts recognized to have been written within Judaism. So it's the book of Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, as well as the book of Chronicles, um, which is different from Christianity, which subdivides Ezra and Nehemiah as two books, whereas Judaism is one book. And Chronicles, Christianity divides into two books. Judaism leaves as one book, Chronicle, versus the Chronicles, 1st Chronicles, 2nd Chronicles. So that is the Hebrew Bible. Uh, very quickly, now, uh, for the Jewish people, the Hebrew Bible consists of, quote, a sacred history. Sacred history for both human civilization, so how the world began, how did cultures begin, how did societies begin, etc., etc., but also sacred history for their own people as well. The creation stories in Genesis both refer to the creation of all humanity, Adam and Eve story, uh, as well as the Noah flood story and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, who form the ethnic, uh, ethnic uh, fathers of all ethnicities. It also gives the creation story for the nation of Israel the calling of Abraham and Sarah. So it gives those two sacred histories. Um, history, history is just another way of saying story, a story of the past. And for the religion of Judaism, getting back to my main point, Jews as a people of story, um, Judaism begins and ends with a story. Now, Christianity has been described as a religion of story and has often been described as the greatest story ever told. That's, in fact, the title of the movie. Um, however, as we'll see with our election, really, Christianity is a religion of creeds and doctrines. 
what we would call an ortho orthodoxy religion. Having the right practices, having the right beliefs is what's really essential to what it means to be a Christian. Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism all have great stories as well. But those religions aren't defined by their stories. Maybe Buddhism a little bit more so than, than everything else, but not, not necessarily. Rather, as a religion, those, those religions are really defined more so by the right practices you do, the right re rituals that you do. So we call those orthopraxy, meaning right practices. So Christianity is an orthodoxy religion, right doctrines. Islam, to some extent, some right doctrines as well, but more so right practices. Hinduism, for sure, right practices. Buddhism, right practices, for sure. Those are orthopraxy religions. Ju Judaism is different. Sure, it has its elements of orthodoxy and orthopraxy that are very vital for its faith, but for Judaism, as, you, as we will see um, in our talks about Jewish festivals that we'll talk about throughout this, the year within Judaism, it's real important to retell the story, to reenact the story, to actively participate inside the story that are found in the Hebrew Bible and found throughout their history and traditions. So to be Jewish is to retell and participate in the stories of their people as uh, and you see that in all of their religious festivals that we'll talk about throughout the year so depending on when we're taking this course you'll see me talk about passover or pesach of the feast of purim or sukkot or yom kippur you'll see that it's active participation Jews do activities and part of their activities is retelling the story as well as in every Jewish services inside a synagogue. A synagogue is a, a, a word that means a Jewish meeting place for religious purposes. When Jews meet for religious services at a, at a, at a synagogue, it's basically one giant reenactment story. They're reenacting the story of Moses receiving the law every Sabbath, reenacting the story of Moses receiving the law out Mount Sinai and giving it to its people. That's what synagogue is. So Judaism is much more so a story about, or let me rephrase that. Judaism is much more about a religion of story to be Jewish is to retell, to retell the story throughout their traditions, throughout their cultures, and to actively participate within those stories, reenact them even today. And so that's what makes Judaism a little bit different. So let's now talk about some themes of Judaism, some themes of Judaism. As already indicated before, Judaism is a religion of stories and narratives that are preserved in the pages of the Hebrew Bible and are thus relived and reenacted through the celebrations of festivals and holidays. At the heart of a really good story is a really good theme. A theme that helps drive the plot along, that makes the literary narrative come alive and that resonates within our souls and that we read it and we continue to read it and read it again. And it means something. So, so, so take example, Harry Potter series. There's various themes that play throughout the story that drive the plot line forward. Themes like death, particularly dealing with the death of a parent or parents in the story of Harry, of how being an orphan affects you, affects your friendships, how you see the world. Very powerful limit, uh, literary themes that, again, drive the story forward. Harry wants to understand why did his parents die? How did his parents die? Did his death of his parents have a purpose? It, it, the death of his parents provide an explanation of why Harry's life is so different from everybody else. It explains why Harry is alone and yet why he's obsessed with wanting to know what his life 
would be like if his parents had never died. He's jealous as he sees the life that the Weasleys have or others. Another theme from the book is real friendship, a theme. Harry's able to be the greatest wizard of all time because of his friendships. Harry does have a family. Or, uh, let me rephrase that. Harry doesn't have a family like everybody else, but what makes him great is because of his friends and his friends become his family. And even when he tries to push his friends away as an attempt to save them from pain, it's Harry's friends that embrace his pain and are willing to share in it. Uh, the same can be made about Star Wars as well as a literary book and device. The themes of son not being destined to be their father drives the story home. Luke is not Anakin. Luke is not Darth Vader. Or another theme that no matter how far someone has fallen, everybody is redeemable. The father redeems, or the son redeems the father. Or another theme of goodwill will always triumph over evil over time. It takes three, three movies for good to eventually triumph over evil, the death of the empire. So again, very important things, very important themes. And those themes also exist in the Hebrew Bible and for Judaism as well as a religion. And for Judaism as a religion, as well as the Hebrew Bible, there is a cyclical theme of election, exile, or excuse me, election, exodus, and exile and return. That cites those four cycle themes return and play themselves out throughout the pages of their history of the Hebrew Bible, as well as the pages of the history in the ideology of the Jewish people as a religion as well. And so those are important themes for us as well. Election, exodus, exile and return. So the first thing that I want to talk about is that of election. The term election refers to a religious ideology of belief that a divine entity chooses an individual or group based on whether conditional or unconditional purposes. So within Abrahamic religions, the religious term of election is generally translated as predestination. And with Jude, within Judaism, the Jews believe that they are the chosen people of God. They're God's chosen people. They are Chacham Hanavakara. They are the selected people. They're selected above all else from the earth. And they're selected to be in a covenantal relationship with God. Now, very quickly, I need to diffuse you of the idea that the Jews believe in some kind of ethnic superiority based on that elected above all else, chosen above all else. This is a misunderstanding, and that misunderstanding has led to vast and gross anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism meaning violence and racial persecution against Jewish people. It has led to later Christian reinterpretations that which eventually would support white supremacy as well. So this is not what I mean. Instead, the idea of election here of God's chosen people means that the Jews have this special responsibility. They have a, a special responsibility that's above all other people on the earth. And that responsibility is outlined in the covenant, but more so that the Jews are required to have a relationship with God. So that's something different. As a religion, Judaism is a strict monotheistic belief system, meaning that the Jews believe that there is only one supreme deity and no other gods or goddesses exist. Judaism's main and only deity is God. However, um, this is an English translation, God, um, for the Jewish God, God. That's not his name. Um, but we typically call God, God in Christianity and as well as um, uh, Judaism, um, sometimes Islam as well, because the name just simply means it's used, simply means God. Um, but for Judaism, we really do not know the name of God. 
The only clue that we have for the name of the Jewish God comes from the Hebrew Bible when the prophet Moses asked in Exodus chapter 3 verses 13 and 14, what is your name? And God responds, thus you shall say to Israel, to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. The name for the Jewish God, at least in the Hebrew Bible, is a verb. Eya. Eya. Which means I will be or I am. So we really don't know the name of God. And therefore the Jews use epithets or descriptions as the name of God. So inside the Hebrew Bible, you'll f find five common epithets that are used throughout the Hebrew Bible for the name of God. You'll see the Hebrew word Adonai, which means Lord or an overseer. You'll see the epithet El Shaddai, which means an almighty God. El Tavadzul, which is the God of hosts or the God who leads an army. El Roi, uh, the God who sees, or El Olam, the God who never dies. Inside rabbinic sources that we'll talk about later, you'll see the epithet uh, Hashem, which just simply means the name. But outside of these epithets that I mentioned other, there's really two that are the most common that get used all the time throughout the Hebrew Bible to refer to the God of the Jews. Um, Elohim or Ela, depending on Aramaic translations or Aramaic manuscripts, or Yahweh. So first, the term Elohim or the Aramaic term Ela means, just simply means God. And is what is used to refer to any deity in any other culture within the ancient Near Eastern culture. So the, Bab the gods of the Babylonians, like Marduk, in Hebrew, is Elohim. He's a god. Marduk is an Elohim. Um, the Egyptian god, uh, Osiris, he's just simply an Elohim. He's a god. Canaanite god, Baal, yeah, just Elohim, Ella. Yeah, whatever. But also the terms Elohim and Ella are plural forms. Meaning that it's not simply God, that it sometimes gets translated in the Hebrew Bible, but it's actually gods, plural. So this term is very problematic in the Hebrew Bible because the Hebrew Bible states the Jewish people are only to have one God. Deuteronomy 6.4, there's only one God. He is one. Um, there's also a great amount of evidence in the Hebrew Bible and archaeology that the ancient Jewish people were polytheistic at the very beginning, believing in multiple gods and goddesses. So this might be an explanation for that, as well as there's the fact that Elohim is found in Canaanite language as well, because again, it just means God, and at the ancient city of Ugaric. And in Ugaric, uh, Elohim is the chief deity of the Ugaric pantheon. So thus, many people believe that the Jewish belief system early on was similar to that of their ancient Eastern, ancient Near Eastern neighbors. So that explains the synthesis. But the term Yahweh is the more popular term and is used for the Jewish deity and is what scholars believe is the actual name of God. However, again, uh, this belief is a little problematic as well. First, the, the name Yahweh is a scholarly reconstruction. As I have an image here. This is the name of Yahweh that's reconstructed through various Hebrew manuscripts and traditions of various Hebrew scripts that have been preserved throughout time. The name of Yahweh is this reconstruction. It's a reconstruction of Hebrew letters and Masoretic notes of the past that have been preserved and passed down. And what's also problematic is the nature of the Hebrew alphabet. The Hebrew alphabet is what is known as the Abjda script, an Abjda script, meaning that it only has consonants in its alphabet. Hebrew has no vowels. It has no vowels whatsoever. So no vowels are actually written 
but vowels are implied and said. So again, this is the written alphabet side. So let me let me make that clear. He, Hebrews do have vowels because you can't make noise without vowels. But you can write without them. And that's how Hebrew works. Hebrew is a Semitic language, and most of the Semitic languages do not have written vowels. Arabic, for example, has no written vowels. Aramaic has no written vowels. Syriac has no written vowels. Hebrew has no written vowels. But they're there. They're implied. They're said and remembered. So, so a good example would be if I write on the board here, I write down on a piece of paper this word, this phrase, M Y N M S J S P H. By context, we can tell what that's supposed to say. We can supply the vowels there. My name is Joseph. The same is with Hebrew, and that's how Hebrew works. So the name of God in Hebrew is written, as you can see there in the images on the screen there, Yahweh, and those are all consonants. The Yo, He, Bav, He, those are all consonants. So it's what you're seeing there is, if I transliterate it into English, is Y, H, Y, W, H. Again, no vowel. This four letter word is what is known in scholarship as the tetragrammaton or simply the four letters second so again let me let me make that clear we don't know what the vowels are so that's problematic because of the nature of hebrew alphabet second second problem comes from the masoretics themselves and the nature of the ten commandments so when the knowledge of Hebrew began to die out and be replaced by other languages, Aramaic, then later on Arabic, among the Jewish people, um, a, a group of specialized scribes emerged and biblical scholars who are known as the Masoretes, M-A-S-O-R-E-T-E-S, -E -E the Masoretes. The Masoretes decided to devise and to develop a vowel notation system, meaning adding vowels to the text in order to preserve the Hebrew language so it doesn't die out and, and thus to preserve the Hebrew Bible so it doesn't die out. You know what the language means. You know what the words mean. However, when the Masoretes came to the name of God, <laughs> they did not add vowels. They left it blank. Or they would add vowels for other words to it. Particularly, they would add the vowels of Adonai or Hashem to the text so that you never pronounce the name of God because of Exodus 27 from the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. Meaning, don't say the name of God. So we really truly do not know the name of God. It's not fully known, but we believe as scholars, we believe that it is Yahweh because of vowel pronunciations that have been somewhat preserved, uh, as well as other languages and other epigraphical evidence, but we won't get to that. But for our purposes here, you'll hear me use the term God, but you'll also hear me, hear me use the term Yahweh. I'm referring to the Jewish deity here for judaism yahweh is both transcendent meaning wholly independent and removed from the material world and imminent meaning actively involved in the material world so almost this contradiction yahweh is transcendent from the world as well as intimate in the world actively involved in it but far removed from it as well Yahweh is also conceived as a perfect being, free from all faults, uh, deficiencies, and defects. For monotheism religion, this is what I really want you to note here, specific for Judaism, and it also goes within Christianity and Islam. Yahweh is an omnipotent, which is Latin for all-powerful, omnipresent, 
which means always present and ever eternal, uh, omniscient, all knowing, and omnibenevolent, all loving. Yahweh is all of these four things omnipotent, om, omnipresent, omniscient, omnibenevolent creator deity. Yahweh is considered the absolute source of the universe and as the absolute one. There is no second. He has no second. There's nothing incomparable to him. He is an incomparable being. Yahweh is also considered incorporeal, meaning not created, thus not composed of matter. Um, and even though in the Hebrew Bible, God is often described in masculine or anthropomorphic descriptions, the truth is, is that Yahweh is unimaginable, meaning that God lacks physical characteristics and is an explanation as to why Jews do not have images or statues of their deity, unlike Christianity that does have art and painting and statues of their deity because that's something a little bit different. Judaism, in fact, is what we know as an iconoclastic religion. So iconoclastic religion, meaning that like Islam, and we'll talk about that when we get to Islam even more, uh, meaning that it rejects images of divine beings. So there are no images of the deity like there is with Hinduism or Christianity. However, despite this otherworldliness, um, Judaism, the God of Judaism is a very personal deity, meaning that an individual can have a relationship with God and vice versa. Thus, J Jews believe that God uh, can be experienced through worship, prayer, study, contemplation. But Jews will emphasize that God cannot be truly understood in any true sense like humanity can understand um, a starfish. And we can understand it because we can hold it. We can grasp it. We can cut it open and dissect it and pull out all its guts and understand how it works. We can't do that with God. And that's how Jews believe you can't truly understand God because God is otherworldly. But what Judaism does do, and this is different from what we will get from Islam. Islam does takes the opposite view. Rather, the God of Judaism is understood through what is called positive theology. Meaning that we can understand what God is through descriptions about him. So God is love. We can understand who God is because we can understand and comprehend what love is. God is holy. We can understand and comprehend what holy is. God is jealous. We can understand what jealousy is. So this is what is known in theology as positive theology. So we can understand who and what God is. And it is this God of Judaism who has chosen the ancestors of the Jewish people to be his special possession and to be their personal God. And the story of this election is told and displayed through covenant. And so covenant is the most important theme of Judaism and is what you really need to understand and what helps us going forward um, throughout this lecture and throughout understanding Judaism. So covenant. At the core, as previously stated, at the core of this story, at the core of this religion is a narrative around the relationship between the ancient Jews and their God, Yahweh. This relationship between the Jewish people and God is called in the Hebrew Bible. It's called Berit. Berit or covenant, which berit in, in Hebrew just literally means to cut. And that term is always in relationship to animal sacrifices, cutting up an animal in order to sacrifices. But more broadly, it literally is interpreted as a pact, creating a pact, or better yet, a treaty. Treaty is the better word here. That's the word we're going to use, treaty. So remember that covenant treaty. 
all of Judaism, whether modern or ancient, is defined and shaped by the idea of covenant, by the notion of this treaty. The treaty that is described and played out in the pages of the Hebrew Bible. So to properly understand Judaism as a religion, you have to understand what is covenant and how does it work in the Hebrew Bible. So again, what is covenant? Very briefly. In the Bible, as well as ancient Near Eastern scholarship, so biblical and ancient Near Eastern scholars um, such as, uh, let me think real quick, uh, yeah, uh, Moshe, uh, Moshe Winfield or George Mendenhall, they would describe and chronicle the fact that descriptions and functionality of covenant in the Hebrew Bible have exact parallels to what we see in the ancient Near Eastern cultures, particularly between the suzerainite treaties and the royal grants of ancient Near Eastern. So to understand what covenant is, it's helpful to understand parallels within ancient Near Eastern cultures. So first, the suzerainite treaties. Suzerainite, um, um, suzerainite treaties refer to a, a binding agreement between one protectorate nation or one protectorate city-state or one protectorate political entity. It could be various hosts. One of those relationships with what is known as a tributary, a tributary nation or tributary state, city-state or tributary political entity. So there's a relationship between those two groups, a protectorate and a tributary in which external actions and policies, finances, and relations of the tributary party are controlled by the protectorate in exchange for political security and limited self-rule given by the protectorate to the tributary. So we typically call these suzerainite treaties vassal treaties or client treaties or suzerainites. The most famous example of a suzerainite treaty comes from the ancient Hittites who ruled what is today modern Turkey and who oversaw a, um, a huge kingdom or an empire that was actually made up of various client states that they had entered into these suzerainite treaties. That they would enter these suzerainite treaties and part of it would be this, they would supply the, these client states would supply soldiers and resources to the Hittites in exchange for protection and stability against the against the ancient Egyptians who were consistently raiding the territory to expand their territory or the sea peoples as well famous people who are credited with the collapse of the Bronze Age civilization um, uh, a more modern day example would be the relationship that Great Britain has over India um, in history or Africa or Australia or Scotland today even so that would be a better example if you look at those relationships Scotland even though it's somewhat independent it's not fully independent it's controlled by an external party London um, so that's the suzerainite treaty a royal grant in the ancient Near Eastern is basically that a master rewards a servant for act, for an act of loyalty um, so either giving them land, giving them title, giving them gold, things like that. We see that, think of medieval knights, you know, knights were servants of a king and in exchange for their service, knights were given castles and given land to rule and a fiefdom to rule. So think of that. Uh, in the Hebrew Bible is full of these ancient Near Eastern political relationships, especially the Suzerainite Treaty. In fact, we know that the ancient Jews had suzerainite treaties with the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the various Greek kingdoms that have emerged, even the Romans up until Jesus' time. We know that the Jews had these relationships with them. So it's not a surprise that the Hebrew Bible looks at that covenantal relationship and applies it to their relationship with God. So that within the religion of Judaism, the covenant was basically this vassal protectorate relationship status between the Jews, who are the vassals, and Yahweh, who is the protectorate. So you see statements like in Jeremiah chapter 30, you, Israel, will be my people, and I will be your God. 
That's a very formulaic statement that you found throughout the Hebrew Bible, and it's a clear indication of the suzerainite relationship. You are to be my people, and I will be your God. Um, the Hebrew Bible uh, outlines various covenantal agreements. Uh, when uh, these various covenantal agreements, that when they're study, can elucidate a comprehensive understanding of how covenant was to be established, how it was to operate between all parties involved, how the vassal was to operate or the tributary, how Israel was supposed to operate, how God was supposed to operate. And it also provided consequences if those relationships were jeopardized. And so the first and perhaps the greatest of the covenantal agreements is the Abrahamic covenant which is found in the book of Genesis chapters 12 through 17 and forms the basis of the theme of election that we've already talked about thus far. So what is it, the Abrahamic covenant? Well, basically the covenant was made between Yahweh and the patriarch Abraham and whose example of faith is the foundation for the religion of Judaism as well as Christianity and Islam. The Abrahamic covenant has four parts. So the first of this is Abraham and his descendants are to be called out. The term elect is used here. Called out by God to worship God exclusively. The Hebrew Bible advocates for the first of a first kind of a henotheistic religious relationship. And we already looked at henotheism when we talked about um uh, Hinduism and the Bhakti traditions, but here I'm going to define Hindu Hinotheism again. Um, that Hinduism uh, is the meaning, uh, uh, meaning the worship and adoration of one God or goddess at the expense of worshiping others and recognizing others. The ancient Jews are repeatedly told in the Hebrew Bible that Yahweh is a jealous God and that he didn't want them worshiping other gods. However, as the, the religion evolves, Judaism becomes a strict monotheistic religion and that believing that there's only one deity in all of existence and the rest of the gods are false. So Judaism does evolve at this time from henotheism to monotheism. So the first element is that they are to be called out by God and called out to worship him exclusively. The other second theme is that because of their exclusive worship and loyalty to God, in turn, Yahweh promises to make the descendants of Abraham into a great nation. And that this great nation will possess a great land. That this land would be uh, how the Bible describes it in Genesis, quote, between the rivers of Egypt, which is the Nile River, to the Euphrates, which is present-day Iraq. This land becomes known in the Hebrew Bible and Jewish traditions as the promised land. At the same time this promise was made by God, Abraham was childless, a childless senior at the ages of set close to 70 with a barren wife, Sarah, who was equally close to 70 years old, and they lived nomad as nomadic immigrants, sheep farmers, moving from land to land based off the needs of the sheep. The land Abraham and his descendants are to inherit from God, the promised land, consists of the modern-day territories today of the Sinai Peninsula, Israel, Lebanon, parts of Syria, and all of Jordan. Third, because of their faith and loyalty, Yahweh will bless Abraham and his descendants, both in material and immaterial ways. And Yahweh will curse those who seek to harm Abraham and his descendants. This uh, part of the Abrahamic covenant has always been interpreted as Yahweh will always protect the Jewish people and will always cause them to proper as people and individuals if they worship God alone and stay faithful to the covenant. And they've always interpreted as God will judge, punish those nations or individuals who do harm to the Jewish people. So have faith. Don't retaliate to them because God's going God's to get them. 
and has also been interpreted as God providing the Jewish people with an afterlife, an afterlife of bliss and an afterlife of torment for those who harm the Jews. So a basic concept of heaven and hell emerges out of the Abrahamic covenant at this point. Very basic, but it evolves over time. Fourth and final theme of the Abrahamic covenant is that of male circumcision. That male circumcision or barit milah will be the sign of the covenant. And so real quick, if you're not aware what male circumcision is, male circumcision is the surgical removal of quote unquote the foreskin, uh, which is just extra skin that covers the gland and the ur urinary metus of a male penis. Uh, male circumcision is very is common. It's been practiced throughout the world, throughout various cultures throughout the world. The Jews aren't the only ones who do circumcision uh, or circumcision of the males um, only. Um, but for within Judaism, only Jew uh, within Judaism, only males are circumcised. Females are never circumcised in some cultures. Females are circumcised. Um, which they remove the clitoris gland from females. Uh, that's um, very barbaric, a very barbaric practice that the, the UN has labeled as uh, mutilation. Uh, Jews don't practice that. They only practice male circumcision, but however, there are some cultures who do practice male circumcision for other reasons as well as female um, circumcisions. Uh, for the Jewish people, the reason they perform male circumcision is it's only to be performed on babies and only on babies after eight days from their birth, according to Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3. And male circumcision is generally seen as a, a male rite of passage or is done for health reasons for males. Uh, but for the Jewish people, it's mainly a physical reminder of their covenantal relationship that Jews are to have with God. So it's really a mark of not only the covenant, but also a mark of ethnic identity. Male Jews who fail to be circumcised are believed to suffer in Judaism what is known as kareth, kareth, K-A-R-E-T-H, kareth, which means to be cut off and cut off from the Jewish community and that their soul cannot share in the olam habab, Olan Chabab, which is the world to come in Judaism, is the afterlife. Ola Chabab. Now, I should also make it cl very clear at this point that Jews do not believe that every male needs to be circumcised in order to be saved by God. Rather that this commandment, this mixvot, is a Hebrew word for, for, for commandment here, mixvot, uh, only that the Jews, Jewish people, not the goyim, not the non-Jews, are to practice male circumcision. And because Jews are called out, that is why they're called out, they're elected by God to have this covenantal relationship. So only Jews, male Jews, are required to have this relationship. Non-Jews don't have to be male circumcised. Um, however, I should note that in modern times, not all Jews believe this anymore. And there's some Jews who no longer practice male circumcision because they see it as mutilation um, or as an antiquated practice of the religion that needs to be abandoned. So, um, but the point here, the overall point is if I were to summarize the theme of election in light of the Abrahamic covenant, it would be that the Jewish people have been selected by God to enter into a covenantal relationship that evolves with their strict worship of Yahweh as a supreme deity, and that males are to mark their body with a special procure, uh, or special procedure that serves to create an identity and to remind them of their responsibilities. And if the Jewish people fulfill their responsibilities, Yahweh will always bless them. Yahweh will always protect them. Yahweh will curse their enemies. Furthermore, if the Jewish people fulfill their responsibilities, Yahweh will give them the promised land as an inheritance and an inheritance of their descendants for forever and forever more. So why the Abrahamic covenant is extremely important. So that's election. So back to our themes of election, exodus, exile, and return. That's election. 
Our second theme that also relates to covenantal relationship is that of Exodus. Exodus. <coughs> here, let me take a quick drink here. All right. So our next theme of the Hebrew Bible and of the religion of Judaism is Exodus. And Exodus, like Torah, is both refers to a literary book within the Hebrew Bible uh, that alludes to the founding mythology of the ancient Jewish people. Uh, but it also refers to a particular time period, in a time period where the Jews found themselves enslaved for 400 years to the Egyptians and that required divine deliverance. But really think of the divine deliverance here, and that's what Exodus really means, divine deliverance. So what was the Exodus? Well, in a summary, basically, the Exodus uh, was an event that through divine providence, um, which refers to, to, to divine providence means um, um, God acts on, the, on behalf of people to, interact, to interrupt history in order to accomplish a goal, basically. Um, that through divine providence, God raises up a reluctant hero prophet named Moses to deliver God's words to the Egyptian Pharaoh and then subsequently to lead the Jewish people out of their bondage and into a covenantal relationship with God and then into the promised land through various miraculous acts performed by God through the prophet Moses. The Exodus story and theme represents both a promise of redemption as well as a promise of deliverance. The book of Exodus opens with these verses, quote, after a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites, who are the ancient Jews here, groaned under the slavery and cried out. Out of their slavery, their cry for help rose up to Yahweh, to God. God heard their cries and God remembered. That's the key word. God heard and remembered. God heard their cries. God remembered their covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites and God took notice of them. So throughout their history, the Jews have been heavily persecuted and harmed because of their ethnicity, but more particularly their religious beliefs. In every country that they lived in, they've been harmed. And during their times of persecution, the Jewish people would remember and re, would reinterpret the situation, their current situation, through the prism of the biblical Exodus story. And that the hope that is found in the Exodus story would provide them hope for today. That the Jewish people would be delivered and redeemed by God regardless of a timeline as to when that will occur, but it will be a certainty. God will deliver them as long as they remain faithful to the covenant God remembered their covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. As it says in Exodus, Jews will reinterpret that to mean today as well. So this idea and belief are best seen in the Jewish celebration of and participation in uh, the religious festival of Pesach, or better known as Passover. That Pesach is a ritualized set Seder meal that Jews actively participate in not only recalls the events of the Exodus story, but also recounts the trials and tribulations of the Jewish people uh, throughout their history. And Pesach is also forward-looking, as it offers hope for the Jewish people of when they might be redeemed again, like their ancestors were in the Exodus story, and be brought back from the diaspora and be able to worship God in Jerusalem again. The Exodus event and story represents a calling for the Jewish people, similar to that of the Abrahamic covenant. And several places throughout the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy, God states that he had called out and chosen out of all the people on the earth, Israel, Israel to be his treasured possession, to be a holy people to God alone. So it is thus the Exodus theme that explains how God is chosen 
and how Israelites can be holy and a treasure possession to God, which leads us to our second covenant in the Hebrew Bible, the Sinaitic covenant, or sometimes referred to as the Mosaic covenant. This covenant was made famous following the events of the Exodus story with the prophet Moses ascending Mount Sinai, or if you read the book of Deuteronomy, Mount Horeb, but they're the same places, um, in order to receive the law of God. This covenant is both a continuation of the covenant of Abraham as well as an addendum, meaning additional materials were added to the end of the document or contract. So this is like an addendum to the Abrahamic covenant. The Sinaitic covenant is largely an affirmation of the Jewish relationship, the covenantal relationship with God. As it says in Exodus 29, 45, I will dwell among the sons of Israel and I will be their God. But the Sinaitic covenant is more so a, condu a conditional agreement, a contract, meaning if you do this, I will do that. So an example would be from Deuteronomy 4, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Quote, so now Israel, give heed to the statutes and law that I am teaching to you to observe, so that you may enter and occupy the land that God has given to your ancestors and is now giving to you. You must neither add to what I command nor take away anything from it, but keep it. And similarly in Deuteronomy 6, 3, hear, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that you may go well, so it may go well with you and so that you may multiply greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord God, your answer has promised you. So you hear the conditional statements here. Hear this law so that it will go well with you. Within the Sinaitic covenant, Yahweh uses this particular phase over and over and over and over and over again. So an example is from Deuteronomy 4.20, quote, But the Lord has taken you out and has brought you out of Egypt to become a people, a people very, uh, a, a people of uh, very, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a people, his very own special possession. That term, very own possession, uh, in Hebrew actually means treasure, ozar, treasure. And it conveys this ancient Near Eastern idea of a monarch who's entitled to wealth of a country or the rights of a protectorate to receive payments for a vassal because of their uh, treaty. So the Hebrew Bible, uh, this term is often conveyed as a, um, not so much treasure in that ancient Near Eastern sense. So I would disagree with that statement, but it's mostly as a marital relationship, a relationship between a husband and wife. And so with a marital relationship, there's certain notions of, of duties and responsibilities that come with having the relationship. So the Sinaitic covenant and introduces the notion further that Israel and Yahweh have this personal relationship, like a husband and wife. It's on an individual relationship. So within the Hebrew Bible, this personal relationship has with it a responsibility and an expectation, as does a marital relationship. And so you will see in like Leviticus 11, God will command to the Jews, Consec consecrate yourself and be holy for I am holy. This phrase to be holy is equivalent to the old English word hollow. Um, and it refers to acts of sanctifying or dedicating or consecrating yourself for religious purposes. Usually to encounter the divine. So this we saying, hey, Israel, Prepare yourself for encountering the divine of being in a relationship with me. It's how you should interpret it. Meaning that Israel was to actively make themselves ritually and religiously pure so that they can be in relationship with God. Similarly, as a bride and a groom or a husband and a wife maintain sexual purity with each other because they're in a personal relationship. 
Thus, the book of uh, the bulk of the Sinaitic Covenant lays out statutes and ordinances, but really, it's laying out teachings, teachings to the Jewish people to instruct them. That's the key word here: instruct them, instruct them how they can be holy, just as God is holy. So, how are you to be holy? The Hebrew Bible makes that very clear. It says things like honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not covet your neighbor. Do not lie or make slanders of one another. That's the Ten Commandments. It's part of the Ten Commandments, and that's how we are to be holy. Right? You're asking yourself, well, that doesn't sound religious. That just sounds very common sense to me, like being a good person. Instead, what we need to think of is someone who, who someone being holy, we need to think of a pious man or pious woman. That's t- typically what we think of when we think of holy. We think of those things, not for Judaism so much. For Judaism to be holy is to have a way of life, an all-encompassing lifestyle, a way of living, an I- a theological ideology that applies itself to your to your everyday life, and that in Judaism is known as halakha, halakha. So halakha is a Hebrew word that literally means to walk about. Uh, it is generally translated as a way, the way to walk or the way to live your life. And that's really how you should interpret Torah. Torah is not so much law as it's about the way to live your life. So um, Halakha can refer to a collection of Jewish laws and statutes, the, 13, or the 613 commandments that are found in the Hebrew Bible the mitzvot, uh, they're known as halakha, and that's true. But again, like I was trying to say, halakha is much more than that. It's a way of living your life, to live your life in accordance with the covenant, to be holy for I am holy, says God. And that idea of living your life a certain way is played out in the most centralized text within Judaism. And the most sacred of all scriptures within Judaism is found in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, known as the Shema Israel. And it kind of operates as a creed that Jews say every morning and every evening during their prayers. The, this this verse serves as a centerpiece for Jewish beliefs, and it affirms Judaism's strict beliefs in monotheism and the duties of halakha. So the so the Shema Israel comes from Deuteronomy six four through nine, and it goes something like this: "Quote, hear, O Israel." The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down, when you rise up. Bind them as signs on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead, write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates. So you can see here what really halakha is. Halakha is a lifestyle. All of that in the Shema is a life. How do you live your life? When you wake up. It's always on your heart. When you sit down and talk to your children, when you teach your children, when you're at the dinner table, every aspect of your being is to have halakha forward on your hands, on your forehead, at the gates of your door in your house. It's ever present. It's a lifestyle. The Sinai Covenant also introduces the idea of, of consequences in a sense as well. 
the best. So, so because that's part of also the ancient ancient Near Eastern treaties as well. There's a consequence that has that why you have these relationships that you enter this relationship for beneficial factors, but if you don't do them. There is a consequence there. You know, when we looked at the Abrahamic covenant, there was really no consequence for the Jewish people for not obeying God. But when we get to the Sinaitic covenant, there is now, and it's best seen in Deuteronomy chapter four, verses 25 and 28 quote, when you have had children and your children's children, and they become complacent in the land, the promised land here. And if you act corruptly by making an idol in the form of anything, thus doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God and provoking him to anger, I, God, call heaven and earth to witness against you today, and you will soon utterly perish from the land that, I, that you are crossing the Jordan to occupy, the Jordan River here. And you will not live long on it, but you will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you, disperse you among the peoples. Only a few of you will be left among the nations where the Lord will lead you. There you will serve gods made by human hands, objects of wood and stone that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. This specific example of consequent that besets the Jewish people is known as the exile. A huge historical event, an ideological concept that reshapes Judaism and continues to reshape it today. And I'll talk more about exile here in a minute. But I wanted to add that about it, that the, ex, that the Exodus event also, the Sinaitic Covenant, introduced consequences for the Jewish relationship with God. But these cons the Sinaitic Covenant also introduces a central tenet, a part of Jewish faith as well redemption so back again to, to Deuteronomy 4 verses 25 through 28 lay out the consequences clearly that I just read but the subsequent verses 29 through 31 lay out the pathway for redemption so in 29 and from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and, and all your soul in your distress, when all these things have happened to you in the time to come, you will return to the Lord your God and you will heed him and his commandments. Because the Lord your God is merciful, he will neither abandon you nor destroy you. He will not forget the covenant that he made with your ancestors. This is known in Jewish theology as return, exodus or exile and return. Or another Hebrew word, Aliyah, Aliyah, A-L-I-Y-A-H, Aliyah, which like the exile goes hand in hand and is significantly important within Jewish th theology. And we'll start talking about that here in just a minute. But I wanted to mention those things. The notion of exile and return leads to another vital part of the Sinaitic Covenant the land itself routinely throughout the Exodus story and even to the Abrahamic covenant the Hebrew Bible refers to the geographical land of Israel as the promised land or the land flowing with milk and honey within the Jewish religion the land refers to a promised homeland in which the Jewish people reside from their wanderings. They're, they reside there from their enslavement. They reside there from their persecution. And they live in peace and harmony and security and prosperity. The land is also a metaphorical and allegorical interpretation of the afterlife as well. A promised reality for the Jews who continue and maintain the belief in God and remain faithful to the covenant evermore. That no matter how difficult and hard their circumstances and current circumstances are, they can always be assured that a promised paradise awaits them in the afterlife. And so that's another idea of how the land works. And a final aspect of important within the Sinaitic Covenant is the construction of the Jewish temple. So real quick, I want to talk about that and how God is to be worshipped. Within the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish temple is called a mixkan, 
of Mizkan, or um, it's, that's usually translated as tabernacle in English, or the temple of meaning of meetings. Uh, in Greco-Roman cultures, as well as ancient Near Eastern cultures, the word tabernacle refers to religious structure for nomadic people, tribal people that that um, houses their gods that can be moved and removed as the tribe moves on, and that the house is usually overseen by a priest or a shaman who serves communion to the gods. So it's kind of a tabernacle is a mobile shrine. Uh, this is the same pattern that we see in the Hebrew Bible. In fact, the, the dimensions and the designs of the tabernacle are archaeologically the same as those that we see in other ancient Near Eastern cultures in Lebanon, Syria, and Turkey. Most famous example is at the temple at Al Radan or in the Danara. They look exactly the same as the descriptions of that in the Hebrew Bible. But within Judaism, the tabernacle, and later would be described as the temple, was used as a place where Yahweh would dwell with his people in a room that's known as the Holy of Holies. Uh, this place was this kind of inter room uh, called a cella or a noas uh, in religious terms, where only the high priest of the ancient cult would enter. So the high priest of the Jewish religion would enter and it would only enter once a year to meditate uh, to mediate on behalf of the people and unlike ancient near uh, eastern temples of the day the holy of holies reportedly in the bible contained no idols no statues of the deity it only contained the ark of the covenant which housed the original ten commandments that were written on stone that also housed the, the rod of Aaron that Moses used to perform his miracles, as well as pieces of food that God provided to the Jewish people in the desert known as manna. Um, the Ark of the Covenant in religious terms acted as a palladium, uh, which, which in religion, palladium is an item that is believed to have been given by the gods or fallen from heaven as a gift or a sign of divine protection. So. The, the most famous example of the Palladium is the Palladium uh, of Troy during Homer's um, Iliad, where uh, Odysseus goes and steals the Palladium of uh, Athena, and subsequently the next day uh, the city of Troy falls because the Palladium was stolen. The divine protection over Troy was ended. Outside of this Holy of Holies in the, the Hebrew Bible for the tabernacle and then later the temple was a golden altar where sacrifices were performed by priests and it also contained a seven branch candlestick known as a menorah, which is a huge symbol within Judaism. And also there was a table that always hosted bread or show bread, as it's called in the Hebrew Bible, which is basically an offering to the gods, food. The ancient Jews did practice various kinds of sacrificial offerings to Yahweh called Korban. Um, and its purpose was to give either homage or respect to God. Uh, you perform sacrifices to win his favor or to secure the forgiveness of sin. In Hebrew, the term is avera, which means transgression, or sometimes uh, avoni, uh, which is um, uh, iniquity, evil, or sometimes sin is translated in Hebrew as hata, which means um, to, to wander off, to go astray. But for the ancient Israelite religion, the purpose of sacrifice was to allow for forgiveness of sin and to establish a connection between God and the Jewish people. Uh, the sacrificial system was based on belief that offerings of a sacrifice to God would serve as a way to express remorse for sin and seek God's forgiveness. And so within the ancient Judaism or religion of Judaism, as well as the modern religion of Judaism today, this is still really seen and still played out in the holy holiday of Yom Kippur, which is the day of atonement where Jews seek forgiveness. So really quickly, I just wanted to, to talk about what is Yom Kippur. Uh, Yom Kippur is a Jewish as well as a Samaritan religious holiday, but we won't talk about the Samaritans in this course. 
the Jews' Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. It is observed on the 10th day of the Hebrew month of Tishra, uh, which is always in September or October. Yom Kippur is a, requires Jews to fast for 24 hours straight and to spend the day in prayer and repentance and is to be, believe that this day God seals the book of life for the coming year. So people seek forgiveness for their sins and strive to become better people for the next year, the new year. In biblical times, the high priest would offer a representative sacrifice for all the Jewish people at the temple. They would also present a scapegoat, which in Hebrew is known as uh, La um, Az Azazari, who later in Jewish tradition becomes a, a, an angel, which is interesting, um, which is all sins of the people would be symbolically placed on, side, on the goat through a ritual, and then the goat would thus be driven out of the city and into the desert to wander off and possibly die as a metaphor for your sins, being removed from the community, removed from the people, and being atoned by removing and then subsequently dying off in the desert without you seeing them. Uh, today, the observance of Yom Kippur includes abstaining from food and drink for 24 hours, uh, Jews will wear white clothing, attend synagogue services, and recite special prayers on that day. Uh, and the day is also uh, marked by special services called Kol Nidra, which is a um, which nullifies vows that were made unintentionally or due to distress. Um, so real quick, let's go through the last two of these covenantal relationships. And the third and most important covenant relationship is the Davidic covenant. So this covenant appears in 2 Samuel chapter 7 in which Yahweh through the prophet Nathan promises King David to establish a royal dynasty that will last forever um, to establish the city of Jerusalem as the capital of the kingdom as well as the city that God will dwell in and allow for the permanent construction of a temple, a place where God will permanently dwell among his people. So again, this covenant combines lots of other ancient Near Eastern covenants, particularly the ancient Near Eastern royal covenant, which states that a monarchy represents is represented as the instrument of the will of God so that he can do God's will and ensures that the people will worship the God in order to maintain order. So this is kind of the ancient Near Eastern version of the mandate of heaven that we saw within Confucianism. That in, in that exchange, the gods will ensure that the kingdom will not fail and the dynasty will last unless the, the monarch disobeys the king and then the monarchy ends. So is this relationship with the monarchy. So within the religion of the Jewish people, the city of Jerusalem becomes a center point of their identity, of their religion, and of their culture as the divinic lineage. This covenant is unique in that in the comparison to other covenants that we have mentioned already, the divinic covenant is presented in the biblical narrative as a purely unconditional covenant, meaning there are no requirements for the Jewish people. Unlike the Abrahamic covenant, you know, Abraham needed to leave. He needed to be called out, needed to leave his family and go to a land that God will show him for the covenant to work. Sinai covenant, there's tons of conditions. You need to do this or this will happen. For the Davidic covenant, there is no conditions. It's just a promise made to God, made by God to the people. And thus, the, the condition is God must maintain it. So all the conditions are placed on Yahweh. He will establish the Davidic covenant. He will make Jerusalem the center of the Jewish religion and culture, and he will dwell in the temple. There are no buts. There are no unlesses in this covenant, which makes it very, very unique. But when the ancient Jewish people had lost the city of Jerusalem, when it was sacked and the temple was razed to the ground by the Babylonians in 586 BCE, and that the last king of the Jews had died, the events of that forced the Jewish people to radically evaluate and radically reinterpret this covenant. And they did it in eschatological and 
apocalyptic ways. So, uh, in the field of religious study, the term eschatology refers to the study of beliefs concerning the end of days, which is a prediction that the history and the events of the world will reach a disastrous climax known as the apocalypse. While the term apocalypse in Greek means a uh, revelation, in religious study, the term also refers to a catechismic-like event, which the old corrupt world will be radically changed and evil will be burned away with the, 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 the creation of a new world that's pure and good and that will be brought forth by the forces of good. Often in religion, apocalyptic literature is a form of hope as well as a form of resistance. Because in the end of days, it's seen as divine day of judgment. And that eventually the wicked get their good comings to. And that the divine will restore the faithful from their oppression and, de and destroy the oppressors. So thus the apocalyptic literature is a type of religious re literature that unveils and unfolds events and visions about the end of days. And those events are re revealed to by a divine being to a prophet. So when the Jews lost their temple, lost Jerusalem, lost the monarchy, the divinic covenant was reinterpreted through the lens of apocalypticism. And what the end product was, was the introduction of a new idea, the Messiah. So really quickly, Messiahism is a belief in the advent of a Messiah. This Messiah is a savior-like figure for a group of people. And the, the term Messiah and this idea of Messiahism first emerged within the religion of Zoroastrianism that we've already discussed in this course. In Judaism, the term Messiah, or in Hebrew, Mashiach, means anointed one. And it refers to the ancient Near Eastern practice of, of a priest anointing the, the monarch with holy oil in order to sanctify their duties, to legitimize their authority, and to hold them accountable to the people as well as to the gods. Priests were also... Um, anointed as well so they were received seen as mashiach priests and monarchs were typically seen as mashiachs and the hebrew bible confirms this the term messiah is routinely applied to and used for the kings of jerusalem as well as the high priests and it also seemed to refer to special individuals too within the hebrew bible who were seen as god's instruments to do god's will so there were a few non-jews in the hebrew bible who were called messiahs mashiachs the greatest of them is cyrus cyrus the great this is the same cyrus who is the emperor of the Achaemenian empire of the persian empire who is able to defeat the babylonians and rescue the jewish people and bring them back from exile and return that's why he be called the monarch or the uh, not the monarch the messiah but after the events of the exile and return, the Jewish people, um, the divinic monarch was never restored, was never restored. So how is God going to keep his promises? Thus, the divinic covenant was reinterpreted as well as the role of the Messiah. And so the Messiah became not this current figure this monarch type figure but it came similar to what we see in Zoroastrianism became this future savior like figure who will come one day to restore Israel and restore the divinic covenant at the end of days the last covenant that I want to mention briefly <coughs> excuse me in the biblical covenant that are vitally important for us to understand Judaism is colloquially known as the new covenant that is found in Jeremiah chapter 31. Now this covenant emerged during the events of the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem by the Babylonians in, in 586 BCE. 
while the the covenant this new covenant is the foundation for christianity and christian interpretations of the old testament and of the hebrew bible the new covenant in judaism is received significantly different so you can't apply christian understandings to the jewish religion remember our biases here yahweh spoke to the prophet jeremiah in this new covenant lamenting the fact that the jews had broken the covenant but instead he will give them a new covenant he would establish a new covenant which quote yahweh or i will put my law in their inner parts and in their inner heart i will write it meaning that the teachings of the torah the commandments of the sacrifice of animals, the needing of priests is over. And that the religion of Judaism, because of the destruction of the temple now, the religion of Judaism needs to be largely internalized and transformed into a living religion. And so this is where we have a change in halakha as well. That halakha is about perfecting the inner about transforming the individual be holy for i am holy so instead of doing things externally holiness comes from the inner part inner purity comes first before it exudes external actions and reflects externally so this is how the new covenant is to emerge this is how Judaism is going to change. It's going to change from external forces, external practices of sacrifice, priest, to now internal things. That leads us to modern forms of, of Judaism. So that's why the new covenant is vitally important. So now the rest of the lecture, we're going to be talking about the various branches of Judaism, modern day forms of Judaism today. Traditionally, Judaism rejects the term denomination as an appropriate la label for the different groups and ideologies that exist within the religion of Judaism. Uh, Judaism tends to argue that the term denomination is specifically used and developed by Christians and should be used for Christianity as it doesn't really resonate with Jewish context and it pushes out a Jewish a Christian perspective and Christian biases upon Judaism because that has been historically done on the Jews. <laughs> Just read Paul or read uh, Martin Luther's interpretation of Paul. And so that is very problematic for the Jewish people. So why they don't like the term denominations and we won't use the terms denominations as well. Um, very quickly, if you re recall from our beginning lecture, denomination, denomination refers to a subgroup or subdivision within a religious tradition that operates under a common belief system, but developed alternative traditions and practices. So Judaism argues this classification doesn't work. This definition doesn't work because even though Judaism does have various subgroups, none of these subgroups have introduced new practices or alternative practices. So thus denomination doesn't work. Um, Judaism also doesn't like the word sect sect being s-e-c-t not sex but sect highly criticizes this word because um, it carries with it negative connotation you tend to think of heretics as well as it reflects christian biases once again <clears throat> so if you recall the term sect uh, refers to a traditional and is traditionally defined as a religious subgroup that has broken off from a main religious body and that its separation is irreparable. Judaism argues that this classification, again, doesn't work. For even though Jews do have various subgroups, those subgroups didn't break away from a, a main religious body. <coughs> Excuse me. They didn't break away from this main body, that these subgroups all developed independently, that there's really no main body of Judaism. Instead, what Judaism prefers to use to describe its various subgroups and various religious movements is the term branch, branches or streams of Jewish traditions 
Uh, in religious studies, a branch generally refers to an association of like-minded people to a subgroup of a complex body. That's it. So it fits. This is what Judaism is. It's a complex body of various subgroups within it. So it works. Jewish Judaism is very complex. And the reason it's complex is because of its minority status and how it affected the changes. And we'll talk about that. Judaism has numerous social forces that pulled at it, forced it, and pushed it to evolve. And so it's not the same as Christianity, where denominations emerge, or Islam, where denominations really apply. So this is the term that we're going to use. We're going to use branches, and this is what we're going to adopt going forward. Um, so to understand all modern forms of Judaism, all modern branches of Judaism, you got to understand its roots and the roots of all modern Judaism are within rabbinical Judaism at the religious roots of all Judaism is rabbin what we call rabbinical Judaism or uh, rabbinical Judaism refers to a mainstream form of Judaism that emerged after the fall of Jerusalem and the second destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 CE until the early modern period, the 1700s, where we have modern forms of Judaism that emerge. So rabbinical Judaism becomes somewhat the dominant or orthodox form of Judaism, but we don't use those terms because it, that's not true. It's really a scholastical term that has our historical term that emerged. It is scholars and historians who call what this form of Judaism as rabbinical Judaism because it comes from the main source of religious leadership and knowledge about this tradition as the rabbis. So the term rabbis comes from the Aramaic. So we're, we're moving away from the Hebrew and now into Aramaic terms, but it comes from the Aramaic term rabbi, uh, which basically means my master. Rabbi is an honorary term used by speakers to refer to revered teachers of Jewish traditions. A rabbi is not an occupation found in the Hebrew Bible but it actually appears in the pages of the New Testament at first in the gospel stories where religious leaders are called rabbis. Even Jesus himself is called a rabbi since it's an honorary term. The term doesn't appear until in Jewish literature until around 200 CE. Um, however, as the Jewish community becomes more and more dispersed throughout the globe, the role of the rabbi becomes more and more a functionary role to the local Jewish community. So rabbis were religious leaders. They become religious leaders of a localized Jewish community or the localized Jewish synagogue, serving as public teachers and orators of the Hebrew Bible, as well as orators of the Jewish tradition. They also serve to organize prayer services, organize worship services. In the past, rabbis have acted as civil judges. They've acted as delegating localized disciplines, settling disputes within the communities. In the past, rabbis have acted as legislators, enacting localized rules and regulations for the community, mostly rules and regulations that are all religious in nature, but sometimes, some, some cases, secular rulings, but always religious. Uh, in the past, they've also provided individual and family counseling, as well as business and political advice. The rabbis organized charity and public and their public representatives of the Jewish community to elected leaders or to monarchs. But the greatest function of the uh, of the rabbi within Jewish community was that the rabbi served as a role model to how. Jews are to live their lives in the modern world as well as Jews living their life in the dias diaspora. Many rabbis were idealized as local heroes and extraordinary figures within their history of their religion and their localized community. They were rabbis were never worshipped or venerated as Christians or Sufis or Hindu saints are but rather they're revered 
and they're given a legendary status within their community the same way that George Washington or Abraham Lincoln are given these legendary statuses and have apocryphal tales about them within the United States and our traditions. Uh, real quick, since I talked about synagogues a lot, let's talk about them. A synagogue, a synagogue, or a, the hit, a Yiddish word shul, shul, S H U L, uh, um, is used and refers to a Jewish house of worship or a Jewish house of assembly, as it's called, a bayet knesset in Hebrew, as it would be called. Uh, where Jews would gather for religious services, special ceremonies, civil events, and sometimes the synagogue would function as a school for small children. Uh, sometimes the term temple is used in modern Judaism and is interchangeable for that of synagogue as well. Um, so synagogue, temple just depends on the context and the community where you live in. Um, the term synagogue comes from the Greek word meaning to bind together, synagogen, uh, to bind together. And the, the term synagogue is, or the, the, the function of a synagogue is first credited to the first century rabbi, uh, Yohan ben Zakia, um, uh, who's often credited with creating the idea of we need to have a localized house of worship how but however historians really disagree with jewish tradition here because we can cite evidences of these specialized houses uh of jewish worship existing archaeologically um from jewish communities as well as samaritan communities living throughout the diaspora as far back as the third century bce living in egypt and in, in the greek islands as well that we find these proto synagogue buildings buildings built built specifically for as a gathering hall so they've existed for a very long time it seems uh, but for synagogues the most popular event that's held within these facilities is the worship service in which jews would gather on the sabbath or yiddish word shabbat which is friday evening into saturday afternoon uh, uh um and the transcribing of the uh, uh, Tanakh was also done as well. New copies of the Bible were also done in synagogues. Uh, for Jewish religious services here real quick, I think it's important to talk about how a synagogue functions because probably many of us have never been in a synagogue. There are several things that happen and occur that need to occur. So the first thing is traditional Jewish worship requires a quorum of 10 adult males to be present in order for Jewish worship to begin. This is known as a minya. So you have to have 10 Jewish men in order for a synagogue to take place and happen or to be established. Everyone except unmarried women wear head coverings in order to show their reverence for God. So for men, this is the head covering is known as a kippah or a yamka, uh, a yamka as well or yarmulke sorry uh um adult men over the age of 13 are to wear a talat which is a prayer shawl for the morning prayers um rabbis uh lead the community in prayers and songs sometimes a cantor will as well if the rabbi is not present um every synagogue contains what is known as an ark which is basically a giant cupboard at the uh in the front of the building um uh or the front of the room sorry uh where the scroll the torah scroll is kept and also a desk sometimes a pulpit where the torah will be read uh there's also a light or a candle that hangs above the ark known as the near tamid which symbolizes the presence of god in the building so it's always lit and at the proper moment in the service, the ark is open, ceremoniously open, where the Torah scroll is carried throughout the assembly in a, in a ceremonial procession. And on its way from the ark to the desk, people um, can touch it and they'll pray to it, or, you know, they'll not pray to it, but they'll uh, blow kisses at it, touch it, because of, they'll receive a blessing. And that's when the ark is read. Now let's get us back to the rabbis here. 
Um, back to the rabbis. The rabbis claim uh, claims about themselves and their roles within the community, they argue, is nothing new. So this is why they always say, we don't like the term denomination because the denomination denotes something new or alternative being created. No, the rabbis say there's nothing new of what we're doing. They argue that um, their duties are just continuations of what the priests and the scribes have done, which are mentioned in throughout the Hebrew Bible. Um, it, but however, it should be noted uh, and noted here that they never claim that their role and, and that they have the role and the religious authority of a prophet, rather just that of a priest or a scribe. Instead, they believe that the role and function of biblical prophecy has ceased. And it ceased with the last um, prophecy of the prophet Malachi, and that God will not call another prophet until the Messiah returns. But rabbis do believe in what is known as the bat kol, or the daughter voice of God, which means the small, still voice of God that's still active and that can still give new revelations. But however, this new re revelation will never contradict Jewish tradition, nor will it contradict the Hebrew Bible. So that's why Jesus and the prophet Muhammad are seen as illegitimate within the religion of Judaism, because it contradicts the Hebrew Bible, our Jewish traditions. Um, but yet, even though the rabbis say their origins are nothing new, that we've existed over time, religious scholars and historians argue that no, the real roots of, 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 um, of rabbinic Judaism are found in the religious beliefs of the Pharisaic Judaism and the Pharisaic Judaism movement that emerged in the second temple period of Judaism. So a very important period. And the reason they said that is because the beliefs of the rabbis match exactly to that of what we know of the Pharisees. And so it leads us to support. So thus, to understand who the rabbis are, it's important to understand who the Pharisees were and the Pharisees and Pharisaic Judaism. So really quickly, Pharisaic Judaism was a J Jewish religious, social and political movement that emerged during the Second Temple period. Uh, so real quick, the Second Temple period refers to the period in Jewish history that the Second Temple was built and constructed and existed. So the First Temple gets destroyed uh, by the Babylonians. It was built by Solomon around the year 920, 922 BCE and existed until 586 BCE when the Babylonians destroyed it. When the Jews came back to Persia, from Persia, from Babylon, um, they built their second temple around 515 BCE and existed all the way up until the Romans destroyed it in 70 CE. So that Jewish history is divided sometimes by the temple construction. So this is the second temple period when the second temple was built. So the Pharisees are this re Jewish religious, social, and political movement that emerged during the Second Temple period, and they kind of existed from around 200 BCE, maybe a little bit earlier, all the way up to the destruction of the Temple, uh, Second Temple in 70 CE by the Romans. Uh, the phrase Pharisee comes from the ancient Greek and Arma or Aramaic words, which mean those who are set apart, who are separate. And it is believed to be in reference to either the separation between Jews and non-Jews or the separation of their rival. Um, the, so the rival of the Pharisees were the Sadducees. Both the Pharisees and the Sadducees appear in the New Testament as enemies of Christianity. But much of the information that's found in the New Testament is clearly biased and is seen with skeptical skepticism by scholars and historians as accurate representations of what the Pharisees and Sadducees believed. There are some good representations for sure, but the Pharisees and Sadducees probably weren't as evil as like the book of Matthew portrays them. Um, and while both groups have no surviving documents written um, by their groups, we do know a lot about them. A lot of it's preserved in rabbinical debates. Um, we do have contemporary reportings from his Jewish historians like Josephus that tells us what the Pharisees believed, the Sadducees believed, things like that. The New Testament is a source as well, but not the best source, um, as well as the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. 
The Pharisees were strict monotheistics, like all Jews, and they believed in the existence of an afterlife and the resurrection of the dead, something that is really not found in the Hebrew Bible uh, and why the Sadduceans don't believe it. Uh, but the Pharisees believed it and developed it and what Jews would later believe based off interpretations. The Pharisees were also seen to be more progressive and more liberal in their interpretation of the Bible, as well as Jewish law in comparison to the Sadducees. The Sadducees were very conservative, very orthodox, and had a very rigid interpretation. The Sadducees argued that the Bible was a living document, meaning that the interpretations of the Bible should be compensated for their modern time. So that was what makes them liberal. This is the exact same debate that's played out in the Supreme Court between our justices, whether conservative or liberal. Conservative judges believe that the Bible should be uh, interpreted as it was intended back then in the seven, you know, in the 1700s, whereas liberal justices will say no, the the the, the Constitution is a living document and should be interpreted uh, in light of modernity. The Pharisees recognized the 24 books of the Tanakh as canon of the Hebrew Bible, while the Sadducees, like the Samaritans and later Karaites, would only recognize the five books of the Torah as canon for the Hebrew Bible. So that's a little bit of the basics of them. But to understand who, what the rabbis believed, it's, under, it's important for us to understand four key religious concepts that the Pharisees introduced into Judaism that's part of the conversation that the rabbis pick up and run with it. So the first idea is that of Israel is to be a kingdom of priests. So the Pharisees interpreted passages like Exodus 19, 5 through 6 as a communal and expansive way. They took passages where it says, like, quote, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the people. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. So they take passages like that. And the Pharisees believe that this applied to all Jews, regardless of their social status or their tribal status. And it's not associated with just the Levites who could only be priests that no, God called everybody to be a priest. And thus, to be a, be a priest, you need to live a holy life. The Pharisees taught that because of this calling, that all Jews have a responsibility to aggressively act in performing and maintaining their lives and actions through halakha. That halakha and thus, halakha is an all-encompassing lifestyle. Also, because of this interpretation, it meant that the worship of God was not to be limited to the temple in Jerusalem alone, or not to be limited through fire sacrifices. But Jews could perform worship to God wherever they find themselves. So, this led to some Jews in the diaspora interpreting as meaning they should build their own temples to worship God. So, the most famous example of that uh, from history is the, is the Jewish temple at uh, Le uh, Leontopolis in Egypt that existed from 170 BCE until the Romans destroyed it in 73 CE. Um, however, the bulk of the Jewish community reinterpreted it as the synagogue. The synagogue is now to become the new temples of the Jewish people where the Jews can worship God um, there in the synagogues as well as their homes. And so thus they needed to be holy as well because of that fact. The second thing that they introduced was the idea of the oral Torah, the oral Torah. The Pharisees and later rabbis believe that the Torah is not to be understood as a monolith, meaning a solidified whole, rather is to be understood as consisting of two components, a written Torah and an oral Torah. The oral law or the oral Torah consists of various religious statutes and legal interpretations that are not recorded in the five books of Moses, a.k.a. the written Torah here. The Pharisees would cite three precedences for this view and why they believed in the existence of an oral Torah. So they would quote passages like Exodus thirty-four twenty-seven, which indicates that God spoke to Moses 
And then God would speak to him again, but then then specifically ask him to write things down. So thus having two laws. They would also cite passages like Deuteronomy 12, 21, which says, quote, you may kill any of your herd or flock, which the Lord has given you as I commanded you. The problem is there's no original commandment here that this verse is references. As again, Deuteronomy 12 says, the Lord has given you as I have commanded you. There's no commandment for this. Thus, it is assumed that there was a previous conversation between God and Moses, but that conversation is not preserved or written down. So thus, two laws. They would also cite examples from, for example, in the book of Ruth, that the marriage of Boaz and Ruth appears to be in direct contradiction of the Bible. Deuteronomy 23, verse 3 and 4, where the Bible in Deuteronomy says that a Israelite man can or an Israelite cannot marry a Moabite. Boaz was an Israelite. Ruth was a Moabite. The Bible specifically says that can't happen. Thus, the Bible cannot contradict itself. So what happened was, was a reinterpretation of Deuteronomy. That instead, what the prohibition was meant to say was that Jewish women could not marry Moabite men. But it doesn't say the other way around, that, Moab, that Jewish men can't marry Moabite women. So there's no contradiction here, because Boaz is a male, male Israelite. Ruth is a, male, a female Moabite. So there's no contradictions, thus there's an oral uh, interpretation, thus an oral law is needed, thus we have two laws. So this is how the Torah arose within the Jewish community, representing interpretations and classifications and expectations upon the written Torah. And the Pharisees claimed it developed from an unbroken chain an unbroken oral transmission, hence oral Torah that dates back all the way to the prophet Moses. The Pharisees and rabbis would claim that the oral Torah is also of divine origin. Because again, Deuteronomy 12, 21, the Lord says, as I commanded you. So it has this authoritativeness just like the Hebrew Bible. Number three, that the rabbis and the Pharisees were innovators or preservers. So this actually refers to a debate within Judaism about the Pharisees and the rabbis and how it is related to how they developed the oral Torah, how they've interpreted the covenant relationships. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, later the Karaites that we'll talk about, all accused the Pharisees and rabbis of being innovators of the law. This is a serious accusation. Because within the religion of Judaism, God says, do not add to what I commanded you and do not subtract from it. That's straight from Deuteronomy 4.2. So to the Sadducees, the, you know, the Samaritans and the Karaites, the Pharisees have subtracted. They've added. Thus breaking the law. They added to the law by creating the, the oral Torah, thus breaking and violating the covenant of God. However, the Pharisees and the rabbis would claim that they're not inventors, rather preservers, preservers of tradition, preservers of the spirit of the law and the intent of the law. But the truth is the rabbis are both. They are in, in innovators in the way that they sought to clarify and modify the law as the Jewish community evolved and in the light of modern culture and technologies. So for example, does turning on a light switch constitute work on the Sabbath? Because according to Exodus 35.3, Jews are forbidden from kindling a fire on the Sabbath because kindling a fire constitutes work. They can't start a fire, but they can stop a fire. That's not work, but they can't start one on the Sabbath. So with the invention of light bulb, 
There's no flames, but does turning on the light constitute violating the Sabbath? The rabbis at the time said yes, because they understood the nature of a filament. The filament inside a light bulb uses like electricity to light gases in order to create a light, thus kindling. So turning on a light bulb on the Sabbath is violating the is violating the um, halakha. But what about a power plant? The rabbis would say yes, that if a power plant is on and you're living on, or you know, um, you know, uh, um, um, living in another land and power plant and so hey you know the power plant creates light for me to read a book well the 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 hebrew bible talks about that you can't read by candlelight because you're creating light for yourself but a power plant can stay open on the sabbath because of for example the 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 uh, the jewish doctrine of of pikuach, uh, pikuach Nifsh, Peuak Nish, which is saving a life. So this is why like, traffic lights can stay on because it can save a life. Why hospitals can operate on the Sabbath because they need to save life. Why you can have your refrigerator on to make sure that you're saving a life, that your food doesn't spoil and you get salmonella. Or climate control. <laughs> you know, if you live here in Florida, that it can be very hot. And so climate control can save someone's life. So there are innovation rules. So they are innovators concerning how Judaism was to be performed following the destruction of the temple. How can Jews achieve atonement if there's no temple, if there's no sacrifices? How can Jews commune with God if there are no priests? How can God, God have a relationship with the people if there is no holy of holies anymore? So the rabbis had to do radical interpretations of traditions because ordinary and that's why they believe that because we're a kingdom of priests how we do religion can change temple rituals now turn into prayer services fire sacrifices are replaced with scriptural study the temples themselves are replaced with the synagogues so they are innovators but they're also preservers. The rabbis are preservers of Jewish tradition. That even though the oral Torah was orally transmitted and orally kept alive, around 2000 CE, the rabbi Judah Hanasi sought to write them down and record the oral traditions on parchment. His collections become known as the Mishnah and become the centerpiece of rabbinical literature that we'll talk about for later. So there are preservers of tradition. The rabbis were also the preservers of the Hebrew Bible itself. Oftentimes it was the rabbis in, within Jewish communities who could read and who could write. So it was them who were transcribing the copies of the Hebrew Bible, copies of prayer books and setter manuals in order to make new copies because everything had to be written by hand. And this was done at the synagogue and they were kept at the synagogue. The rabbis were also great memorizers of the Hebrew Bible and were able to write out the entire Hebrew Bible because they memorized it. The Masoretes were rabbis. The Ben Asher family, who was the greatest of all of the Masoretes, who is responsible for the preservation of the Hebrew Bible that we have today, were rabbis. So they are preservers as well. Now, this is a really good place to, to and, and pause for a minute to flesh out the genre of rabbinical literature and why rabbinical literature is so important. Rabbinical literature refers to a broad spectrum of rabbinical writings about the religion of Judaism that covers almost a 2,000 year history. But for our purposes here, when I say rabbinical literatures, I'm referring to a specific set of books that are vital to the religion of Judaism today, mainly the, the Talmud, the Mishnah, the Agidah, and the Haggidah. So the Mishnah, I already mentioned here, the Mishnah you know, uh, was written by Judah um, uh, Hanasi, Judah Hanasi. The, the Mishnah contains the written record of the Oratorah, 
and it contains it through examples and actual case studies presented before the rabbis and it's a preservation of debates and rulings what the Mishnah tries to do is provide clarity for everyday life for the Jew concerning how to fulfill the covenant and how to live according to Halakha so that's what the Mishnah is is a preservation of rabbis talking to each other presenting themselves with scenarios like the light bulb scenario what do you do is driving a car starting a car and traveling considered work is that considered a lighting a kindling a fire well yes gas combustion engines well what about an electric car now this is kind of what the Mishnah preserves but in an earlier time so the Mishnah is very important but the most important book is the Talmud the Talmud is the central text of the rabbis and is the primary source of Je Jewish halakha as well as theolo theology today for many Jewish communities, the Talmud is just as holy and just as sacred as the Hebrew Bible, and if not equally important as the Hebrew Bible. The Talmud consists of 63 books that are in a collection and that are believed to have been edited around 400 to 600 CE. The Talmud contains various sections, several sections on each page. It contains the Mishnah. It contains the uh, Gemara, which is a commentary on the Mishnah. It contains various Tananic writings of rabbis, which are commentaries on the Mishnah and commentaries on the Grama, as well as various Barits that emerged or oral traditions that have been preserved that are outside the oral uh, oral Torah collection. So it's. Is nothing but tradition upon tradition upon tradition upon tradition. So if you ever open up a Talmud, you're reading about six different things inside every single page. The Talmud also exists in two forms. There's the Babylonian Talmud and the Palestinian Talmud or the Jerusalem Talmud as it's known. But the Babylonian Talmud is the more popular, is the more one that's widely used, and is the most authoritative of the two Talmuds. Then there's the Agidah, and the Agidah, A-G-G-A-D-A, -G -G -A, the Agidah, refers to non-legalistic terms, which incorporate folklore, historical anecdotes, moral uh, exhortations, practical advices, um, and various spheres of influences, anything from business to medicine as well. And then there's the Hagidah. H-A-G-G-A-D-A, -A -A, the Haggidah, which refers to texts that are used in Jewish religious festivals and ceremonies. Uh, the most popular Haggidah is the one that's used for the Passover. So I just wanted to talk about what do I mean by rabbinic literature. Uh, and finally, number four, significance of debate. Uh, just as important as any particular um, commandment, mixed vote of the Torah, significant value is placed within Judaism on the importance of debating and questioning within rabbinic traditions. In fact, if you read the Mishnah and Torah, that's basically what you re you're reading, a series of debates and questions being raised over centuries. This is important because rabbis recognize that studying a text or studying a religious tradition leads to interpretation and, le and interpretation leads to debates. So it's only natural. It's part of being religious. So within Judaism, to be religious is to debate, to question. This is how you learn. This is how you grow in knowledge. This is how you grow in faith, is question. And even the name of Israel itself means in Hebrew, the one who struggles with God, or the one who wrestles with God. So questioning, is a part of Israel's DNA. This is part of the rabbi's DNA. So this is the roots of Judaism. And the rest of the branches of Judaism that we talk about is going to be subtle differences to those streams of thoughts. So real quick, let us talk about uh, other um, branches of Judaism. So this is our first other branch, our response to um, the rabbinic Judaism. So our next re Jewish religious movement or branch is the Karaites. 
Karaite Judaism or Karaism. Um, if I could oversimplify Karaite Judaism, it would be simply a saying that they're non-rabbinical. It's a non-rabbinical branch of Judaism. Some would even go as far as saying they're the anti-rabbinical branch of Judaism. However, I think it's more accurately to say that Karaism is a religious Jewish religious movement uh, that's characterized by recognizing only the authority of the Bible. That's it. The Bible is the only authority for Halakha and theology. Karite Jews do not believe in the Ura Torah. That's the main significant difference between them and the rest of Judaism today. Karite Judaism represents the other side of the coin within Judaism. And that Judaism is so dominated by rabbinical views within its religion. So this is why I want to bring it out is because Karaitism is the other side of the coin. At one point in Jewish history, Karaite Judaism had a significant representation within the Jewish community. But however, over time with persecution, with killings, programs, um, anti-Semitism in Germany, as well as in Russia, Karaism has really just dwindled down to around 50,000 uh, 50, people in the world today self-identify as Karaite Jews. The majority of these Karaites live in Israel, the city of Ashdod. Um, they also live in the United States and Turkey, as well as Ukraine. Uh, Karaite Jews argue that their ancestry, just like rabbinic Judaism, um, dates as far back, even further back than the rabbis and the Pharisees. They argue that there's always been a population within Judaism who have rejected the claims of the existence of two Torahs or have rejected the leadership of the rabbis. And that claim is very true. We know that because we have the Sadducees. We have the Samaritans who existed prior to the rabbis and that both rejected the idea of an Ora Torah and who were contemporaries, if not existed before the Pharisees. We also know of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the writings of Josephus, Philo of Alexander, who talk about various other Jewish movements who existed before or during the times of the Pharisees and who have died off. So there's some truth to what the Karaites claim. However, most historians and scholars point to two primary events that led to the advent of Karaism. So it's something of a relatively new phenomenon, but there is truth that it's always existed. But the modern day forms of Karaism can point to significant dates. So the first of these is Karaitism is a reactionary movement in response to Islam. Like Judaism, uh, Islam is strictly monotheistic, as well as part of the Abrahamic family of religions. So excuse me, let me take something to drink. And Islam emerged out of Judaism, just as Christianity. Because of these facts, Islam has a lot, a lot to say about Judaism. And one of its biggest criticism of Judaism is back to Deuteronomy again, that Judaism has added to and subtracted from the Torah, which Islam calls the Torah Tawart, Tawart, T-A-W-A-T-A-W-R-A-T, uh, Tawart. Um, and it chastises Judaism for following the leadership of the rabbis who add things to the Bible in their mind. Another thing to think about is that Islam worships the same God as the Jews. Allah is Yahweh. Furthermore, for much of, is of Islam's history, they were quite successful. And thus it appeared that God did favor Islam, which made many Jews as well as Christians within the region that the uh, Muslims conquered to rethink their own traditions. And so this is where Karaism emerged because they rethink their traditions. Maybe the rabbis aren't right. Karaism is also a reactionary movement to the leadership and the teachings of Anna ben David, who he he, he lived from seven, uh, 715 BC or 17 715, let me say it right, 715 CE to 811 CE. 
Uh, Anna Ben David was widely considered the founder of Karaite Judaism and one of the most vocal critics of the rabbis. Uh, according to tradition, Anna Ben David argued that the Ora Torah was not divinely inspired, but the invention of men, and that he reasoned that the Jewish community suffers today because it is unable to return to Jerusalem because they followed the leadership of Torah and of the Ora Torah and the leadership of the rabbis. According to Karite traditions, the Jewish community in Babylon was ruled by a person known as an, uh, uh, oh gosh, what's it? Exilarch, an exilarch, that's what it was called, an exilarch, which means head of an exile community, exilarch, who reported directly to the Muslim government and acted as a mediator between the Muslims and the Jewish community. It, but he also acted as a religious and secular leader of the Jewish community. So when the previous uh, elixir died in 70, 760, 760, a minority group within Jew, the Jewish community wanted Anna bin David to be the successor. However, the Muslim government wanted somebody else, and that's who won. Uh, but the community didn't like that the Muslim government had a hand in selecting its leader, so we ended up with two rival leaders. The Muslim community wasn't happy, and thus captured Anna bin David and ordered his execution, arguing for treason. But Anna bin David was rescued by his followers and was smuggled out of Babylon and smuggled into Palestine where he lived under the protection of Muslims who were sympathetic to his criticisms of the rabbis. And it was there in Palestine that Anna bin David was able to grow his movement and to gather similarly minded Jews from across the Middle East who doubted the leadership of the rabbis. And so that was where the birth of Karaite Judaism began. Uh, what Karaite Jews believe, they believe in a very strict adherence to the Hebrew Bible and to Halakha that is only found within the Torah. So there are some differences. They reject rabbinical developments to Halakha, reject rabbinical literature as well. So for example, uh, Jew, the Karaite Jews, when they pray, they pray by prostrating themselves on the floor in a very similar way that Muslims pray as well. Modern Jews don't do that, but they, but they pray in a different way. They also refrain from anything that would make them religiously unpure, it's going as far as even in their marital relationships, limiting their sexual relations with their spouse to one day a week, or one day a week, if not one day a month in order to limit their religious impurity. Furthermore, the Karaites believe that the tradition of wearing a tefillim, which the tefillim is the small leather straps uh, that a Jew wears on their hands and wears on their head that contains boxes, uh, leather boxes on it that contain scriptures, passages of biblical scriptures in it. The tefillim and the tradition of hanging out the um, mezuzot, which is the um, has the Shema written on it that Jews have on their doorposts, they believe that those traditions aren't meant to be taken literal. Those aren't literal commandments from God, but rather are allegorical metaphors. So uh, Karaite Jews don't pray with the Tefillim and don't have on their houses or on their buildings the Mezuvots. Also another big difference between Karaite Jews and modern Jews is the question of the Mihu Yehudi, or uh, yeah, Mihu Yehuda, sorry, Mahuda, which means in Hebrew, who is a Jew? Within Karite Judaism, they define Jewish ethnicity through the lineage of the father, which makes sense. This is how Europeans do it as well. Uh, that the primary lineage comes from your the father, that you take on the father's last name, things like that. However, majority of modern Jews believe that Jewish ethnicity is actually through the mother, 
that is not through the father, that is through the mother, and modern Jews take into account instances of rape for that reason, as well as citing the births of Ishmael and Isaac from the Bible. So if you remember, both children are fathered by Abraham, but they have different mothers. Isaac is a legitimate son and recognizes the legitimate son of Abraham because he's mothered by Sarah. He is the legitimate heir of God's promises. It is not the firstborn, Ishmael, because Ishmael was mothered through uh, the, 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 the hand servant, the maid servant of Sarah, Hagar. So the Bible seems to indicate that motherhood matters, matters more so than fatherhood. So for modern Jews, ethnicity and the rabbis would claim ethnicity comes from the mother. But the Karaites would point out that no, ethnicity comes from the father, and they would cite biblical cases as well. They would cite the, the, the two wives of Jacob. Jacob had four wives, but there's two other wives that are non-Jews. Um, Zilpah and Bilhah are two non-Jews, but the children of Jacob through those wives are in fact Jews. They're recognized as Jews. There's no doubts. The rabbis wouldn't claim that they're not Jews as well. Or the Karaites would cite, look at King David's ancestry. It goes all the way back to his great-grandfather, Boaz, who was a Jew who married Ruth, who was a non-Jew. So is King David not a Jew? For the Karaites, he is a Jew, but they would argue with that line of thinking of motherhood is wrong. So it causes some problems. Now this is a good reminder about a truth in the field of religious study brought forth by um, the great um, American religious scholar Stephen Prothro that argued um, and it's all about the small details. The small details matter. So in his book, God is Not One, Prothero argues and resists the urge within religious studies to, in comparative religious studies, to say all religions are the same. And he says that while it might seem as a true in terms of overarching principles and purposes of each religion might seem the same, the differences matter. The differences are mountains out of anthills within the religion itself. And that the small details is what leads to wars. It's the small details that lead to divisions in religion. So these differences between modern Judaism and Karite Judaism seem very small, but are in fact huge details. And that's even displayed in the words of the rabbis. The rabbis wrote very harsh words about the Karites, writing that, quote, that people, <laughs> they're not even listed as Jews, but that people who deny the authority of the oral Torah are to be considered among the heretics, end quote. So this, they're talking about the Karaites here who believe in the same God, who, who read the same Bible, who have the same language and tradition. But again, it's the small details that are huge and unrepairable that make the differences. So the rabbis would go as far as to say that Jews couldn't marry Karaites because of their views about ethnicity. And so there was the possibility that these were bastards or that they were still uh, they had a unique view on divorce too, so that you couldn't marry a Karaite because they could still be recognized as married within modern Judaism senses. So those are some huge differences though and bring up the Karaite Jews. There's also some ethnocultural branches of Judaism that we need to talk about. So as Judaism, as the people become more and more dispersed throughout the globe due to persecution, ethnic and cultural differences begin to emerge. That led to an evolution of different cultures and different traditions within the religion. However, it's important to note here that these are just simply ethnic differences, that there's not much major religious differences here, but these cultural differences are significant and they affect how Jewish tradition is done. And so, uh, for example, Sephardic traditions for things like Passover are a little bit different than what Ashkenazi Jews do and what they consume, what they do practice, how they eat, or even sometimes the words that they use are a little bit different, but the overall arching principle is still the same. 
but it's important to note. So the first one that we want to talk about is the Sephardic Jews or Sephardic Judaism or Sephardium as is referred to. So if Sephardic Jews refers to Jewish practices and traditions of the historic Jewish communities of the Iberian Peninsula. So modern day Spain, modern day Portugal, as well as Northwest Africa. So think modern day Morocco, modern day Algeria, modern day Tunisia, as well as Latin America because of Jews settling these areas um, because of the Spanish and Portuguese conquests. The term Sephardic here comes from the Hebrew meaning uh, referring to the ancient lands of Spain found in the Bible. Um, and the Sephardic community claims that their ancestry on the Iberian Peninsula and as well as North Africa dates all the way back to the reign of King Solomon, so around 920 BCE. Um, however, archaeological evidence doesn't agree with that. Rather, it points to the earliest dates of Jewish populations living in these regions is during the Roman period. So around the first century CE, second century CE. Uh, traditionally, these Sephardic communities spoke a hybrid language known as Ladino. Ladino. In, uh, L-A-D-I-N-O. Ladino which is a combination of Spanish and Hebrew. However, this dialect of Ladino is largely dead, um, but attempts to resurrect this language are ongoing. There's small Sephardic communities in Spain, or not in Spain, in Turkey today, that are trying to revitalize this dead dialect of their culture. Uh, the Sephardic community really prospered during the time of the Al-Andalus, which is the period in which Spain was ruled over by an Islamic caliphate from 711 CE all the way up until 1492. Some of the greatest Jewish philosophers and medical theorists, mathematicians, architects of the medieval period were in fact Sephardic Jews living under Muslim control. This was a golden age of Jewish experiences living in Spain. But in 1492, when Christopher Columbus was discovering America, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain also issued a famous decree which expelled all the Jews from the Spanish kingdom under penalty of death if they did not publicly convert to Christianity. Um, in 1496, King Manuel of Portugal followed suit and expelled the Jewish populations from Portugal. So this action forced many of the Sephardic Jewish communities to flee to either Latin America, to the Netherlands, to England, to Turkey, to Egypt, later to the United States for safety and protection. However, many more Sephardic Jews were forced to convert to Christianity in order to escape death and uh, persecution during the famous Spanish Inquisition. But they continually and secretly practice their faith and culture. Um, so these Jews are known as crypto Jews sometimes, or um, you will see the word uh, Marianos. Both of those terms, crypto Jews or Marianos, are very offensive and per pejorative terms in Spanish or pejorative terms in um Jewish cultures today so just be aware of it but those you, you'll see crypto Jews being used a lot today's time it's very anti-semitic and it speaks back to this period of time as well so those were the Sephardic community the other significant and probably the, the largest Jewish community is that of, or the ethnic largest community is that of the Ashkenazi Jews Ashkenazi or Ashkenazium refers to Jewish practices and traditions of historical Jewish communities in Central and Eastern Europe. So think France, think Germany, think Denmark, think Austria, think Czech Republic, think Serbia, think Hungary, think Poland, think Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Ukraine, Russia, Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, think those are all Ashkenazi Judaism. Um, they are called Ashkenazi because the term first appears in the biblical story of the descendants of Noah. And it's believed that many of the Europeans descended from Noah's great-grandson, Ashkenaz. 
so Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, but also the term Ashkenaz is used in Jewish literature to refer to any European country that is beyond Turkey or beyond Armenia. So again, a.k.a. Eastern Europe, Central Europe. Like Sephardic communities, the Ashkenazi Jews have their own hybrid dialect known as Yiddish, which is the combination of Germanic Slava, uh, Sl Slavic languages that are combined with Hebrew. But unlike Ladino, Yiddish is still actively spoken by many Ashkenazi communities in the United States as well as in parts of Europe today. Um, unlike the Sephardic community, the Ashkenazi Jews face numerous periods of forced segregation, violent persecution, and genocide. However, despite their history, the Ashkenazi community are the most prominent and largest ethnic Jewish community. Uh, they are the most significant ethnic group within Jewish history as well. It is the Ashkenazi community that embraced European enlightenment, that pushed for Jewish nationalism, and for the resettlement of Israel, uh, um, as well as those communities who migrated to the UK, to the Canada, to the United States in significant numbers. So Ashkenazi Judaism is extremely, extremely important uh, ethnic group. Lesser known minority groups within Judaism, um, uh, while you know Ashkenazi and Sephardic Jews dominate Jewish culture, there are other groups. And so I'm just going to mention just a few here. So the other primar primarily group is known as the Misra Jews or the Oriental Jews, and it refers to Jews uh, who, Jew and Jewish practices and traditions of historical communities that never left Palestine or that remain throughout much of the Middle East. Sometimes you'll see, uh, you'll hear um, Mazari Jews, also called Miskari Jews. Um, it's the same word. It just, but the Miskari refers to those who live in Central Asia historically, or also parts of India, as well. So they kind of gotten lumped together. Um, these communities don't have a distinct dialect. They primarily spoke the language of Arabic, Farsi, Turkish dialects, whatever language tongue of their community. Um, they, you know, existed in relatively peace for a very long time until the establishment of Israel in 1948. Once that happened, uh, many of the Muslim communities started to retaliate harshly to those Jewish Jewish communities living um, in their country in response to Israel's successes. Uh, and so that's where they started being persecuted, and you started seeing a migration of these Jews from Arabic countries and countries throughout the Middle East coming to Israel. Um, the other significant group that I want to talk about are Ethiopian Jews, or they're better known as Beta Israel, which Beta in Hebrew means second, second Israel, um, is a very unique <laughs> part of the Jewish culture for to say because they're African. They're hundred percent African. The Ethiopian Jews call them their religious tradition uh Haimanot. And this form of Judaism is very similar to Karaism in that it's non-rabbinical. So there's no rabbinical literature, there's no idea of an oral Torah. But the reason that it's non-rabbinical is because Ethiopian Judaism really developed in complete isolation from the rest of Jewish culture at some period in time. So they're not influenced by developments that happen within Judaism. That They've kind of maintained their forms of Judaism as it was from the earliest days, and we're not sure when those were. So that means that Ethiopian Jews have no concept of oratora or rabbis. Instead, they're led by priests, Cain, as it's known in Gezi. Um, they have monks and they have elders that lead their community. They do have a synagogue that's called a masjid, and they do maintain kosher diets. They do keep the same Jewish calendar, but they only celebrate Jewish holidays that are found in the Bible. So only Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Pesach. Uh, Sukkot, um, Shavuot, Purim, that's it. They don't celebrate the others. Like There's no Hanukkah at all. They also, um, they they have a Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's called the Mashafa'ah, um, but they have no Talmud. 
So again, no rabbinic literatures, but they also have more books, more books that they consider canonical based that emerge from their traditions that the rest of Judaism doesn't have. So an example of that would be the Naga Ar Musi, which is the uh, in English means the um, the talks of Moses or the conversations of Moses. Or the Tezazi um, Sanabat, which is the commandments. The Tezai is the, the commandments of the Sabbath. They, the Ethiopic Jews do speak a different dialect known as Ge'ez, Ge'ez, which is a liturgical language that exists not only within Ethiopian Jew, Jewish tr cultures, but also within the Ethiopic Orthodox Church as well. So Christians will speak Ge'ez as well but only in liturgical settings. So it's not the common dialect of their people. Uh, according to Ethiopian traditions, the Beta Israel community claims that their descendants are a part of the lost tribe of Israel that, ha that happened from 7, uh, 722 BCE. So they emerged from the exiles of the Assyrian persecution and the Assyrian siege of Samaria. Um, but there's also some other traditions that claim that their ancestry goes back to a, a, a man named Manelik, um, Manelik, uh, who is believed to be the son of King Solomon and Queen of Sheba, uh, and that it was him who brought Judaism back to Africa. However, historians and scholars and even the majority of Jews today reject these claims by the Ethiopian Jewish community and argue that Ethiopian Judaism developed um, from Jews migrating from uh, Arabia and Ethiopia during the Roman periods or the Christian Roman periods. Uh, or that they had migrated, that they're remnants of a, a Christian heretical community known as the Ebonites, who observed many Jewish customs and practices, but rejected the claim of Jesus' divinity and asserted that Jesus was only just a human prophet and not the Son of God. However, recent evidence suggests that really the claims of the Beta Israel traditions do seem to have a pre rabbinic origin as their faith is consistent with other forms of Judaism that existed prior to the advents of the rabbis. So it must have existed prior to the Roman period, but we're not sure when their history began. Um, and at first, it's important to note that initially, Beta Israel was not recognized as Jewish, wasn't seen as Jews. Um, However, uh, and even when Israel became a nation in 1948, Ethiopian Jews were rejected citizenship, rejected the right to migrate to Israel because they weren't seen as Jews. However, everything changed in 1973 when the chief rabbi, um, Yovadi Yosef, claimed that the Ethiopian Jewish community were, in fact, descendants of ancient Israelites and that they have the same right as return as all Jews to migrate to Israel. So that has changed. The last bit of information that we want to talk about um, is starting to, to go into the modernity, starting to go to modern forms of Judaism that is today. But the roots of modern Judaism really begin with Haskalah. Haskalah, which is extremely important to note. So the roots of modern branches of Judaism lie at the feet of the Haskalah movement. So what is Haskalah? So it's different from Halakha. Haskalah was a Jewish, uh, uh, was the Jewish community's response to the European Enlightenment. So Haskalah is also known colloquially as the um, Jewish Enlightenment. Um, and it's also um, a, a credited to a founder, Moses Mendelssohn, who was a German, um, German philosopher uh, uh, who is responsible and is credited as the founder of this phil philosophical and somewhat cultural movement. Um, real quick, the European Enlightenment, what was it? The European Enlightenment was an intellectual and philosophical movement that we're still seeing the effects of it happening today. And it is centered around several core, key core ideas that, you know, have, you know, are what we take for advantage today. 
So core ideas like the value of human happiness, the pursuit of knowledge obtained by means of reasons and evidences from the senses, uh, the idea of liberty, the idea of societal and technological progression, po politics, um, ethnicity, religious toleration, uh, fraternity, the establishment of constitutional government, and the separation of church and state. So those are lay at the heart of, of European Enlightenment. And so the Haskalah responded to this, and it had really particularly three aims that it emerged, three contemporary aims of Haskalah. One of those aims was uh, uh, sought to preserve and revitalize Jewish culture and Jewish religion in response to modern society. So how is modern Jude how is Judaism going to survive in a modern world? Is the questions it's trying to ask. It also was how to uh, how can Jews integrate into European society? Trying to answer those questions. And also it helped fought for the achievement of full Jewish emancipation, meaning full citizenship in Europe. The spirit of the Haskalah movement uh, was that that came from the calling of Moses Mendelssohn. Mo Mo Moses Mendelssohn's basically whole philosophy, his writings and his speeches can really sum up in two key phrases: "Come out of the ghetto and be Jewish in the home, but be German in the street." And so what do I mean by that? And I'll explain here. For far too long, the Jewish community in Europe had been subjected to severe persecution and forced into various exiles due to their religious differences and false fears of Christians. Because of their status, many Jewish communities uh, were highly regulated and highly segregated from society. Uh, an example of this is the Fourth Lateran Council of the Roman Catholic Church in 1215 proclaimed that the requirement for Jews to wear something that distinguished themselves as Jews. So if, an example of that would be the Judenstern, the Judenstern, which in German means the Jewish star, which was a yellow badge that all Jews were required to sewn into all of their clothing and to be fully displayed when they're in public, the Judenstern. And they also had to wear the Judenhut, which is uh, German for uh, the Jew cap or a Jew hat, which was a horn skull cap that was either yellow or white in color that all adult males must wear at all times during public so that people can quickly identify who was Jew and who wasn't. Also, many European local rulers and church officials restricted many jobs and professions from the Jewish people and pushing them into marginal occupations that no one wanted to do or jobs that were considered necessary evils, such as tax collectors or collecting rent. Uh, in uh, 1555, Pope Paul, I think it's Pope Paul IV, issued a famous papal bull, which is a papal declaration uh, that significantly restricted Jews from owning property and required all Jews to live in section off neighborhoods that are called ghettos. Um, in Italian, ghettos is a gated community, basically, or a segmented community. But the European Enlightenment radically changed things, specifically how people were classified and identified. No longer were people segmented in, along religious lines, uh, like Catholic versus Protestant, Jew versus Muslim. Instead, people were identified by their nationality. We're French, we're German, we're Italian, we're Irish, we're British. Instead, no longer were and, and, and no longer were we united or unified by uh, a, a common religious belief like Catholics over here, Protestants over here, Jews over there, and the two shall never meet. Instead, what makes us unified as a people is that we're unified by the law. 
So both the American and French Revolution were vitally important and were game changers because both movements claimed that all men were created equal and that we were all created equal because we were equal under the law and not religion. So the question was naturally raised by every Jew in the world at that time, are Jews now citizens? Are we now citizens under the law? Has our status changed? Because no longer are we based off religion. We're based off nationality and our commitment to the law. So are Jews French citizens? Are Jews American citizens? Are Jews German citizens? Those were the questions that were being asked. And so Mendelssohn and other great Jewish minds of the Haskalah movement pushed for Jewish recognition and to actively participate in the European Enlightenment project. But for the Jews to participate in this project, Mendelssohn argued that they had to, quote, come out of the ghetto. And they had to start interacting into European society and with European society. They had open businesses. Open businesses in non-Jewish areas. Be willing to serve non-Jews. They needed to live in non-Jewish areas. They needed to have professions that non-Jews would have. They needed to go to schools and universities operated and owned by non-Jews and study non-Jewish things. As Mendelssohn proclaimed, be German in the street. Mendelssohn also argued, as well as others, from the Hebrew Bible, from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 5 and 15, that they, as Jews, have a responsibility from God to, quote, build houses and settle in foreign lands, plant gardens, eat food you grow, get married and have sons and daughters, find wives for your sons and husbands uh, for your daughters, have children in Babylon, end quote. Mendelssohn interpreted this passage as well as others, meaning integrate into societies that you find yourself. Live in the society you find yourself in. Again, be German in the streets. However, Mendelssohn didn't advocate for Jews to completely abandon their faith as some would, or abandon their culture as others would. That's why he says, be Jewish in the home. Jews are still encouraged by Mendelssohn and others to speak and teach Hebrew to their children, to practice their faith, to celebrate their traditions, that they are to never forget the fact that they are Jewish, that they need to realize that they're also German too. So the Jews needed to do both. Be German in the streets, but be Jewish in the home. So it is in this spirit so it is in this spirit that the Enlightenment, that Judaism as a culture and religion began to ask themselves, how do we live in a modern world? Can we survive in it? Can we thrive in it? Or do we just simply compromise? Should we compromise? So in response to these questions, three main movements of Judaism emerge, and today we call this modern Judaism. So this leads us to our last sections here. So modern branches of Judaism. So with the emancipation of the Jewish people happening all across Europe, the Haskalah movement argued that Jews needed to accultu acculturate themselves to European ideas, cultures, and societies. Even their religion needed to acculturate. So some Jewish thinkers like Lazarus ben David or David uh, Fiedlander argue that Judaism needed to evolve and change so radically or needed to be abandoned altogether so that Jewish people can truly survive in this modern world. But others like Israel Jacobson and Abraham Geiger believe that Judaism must evolve to fit modern times, but that evolution needed to be from a more palatable perspective. So Jacobson believed that the passage of time requires and forces faith and dogma to erode in the face of newer and greater understanding. While Geiger argued that change and evolution are natural parts of the history and development of a religion. In fact, that's what religion does, Geiger would say. It evolves like society, so Judaism now needs to evolve. Both men recognized that it was the aesthetics and the decorum of the religion that truly mattered 
and that made re religion meaningful for people and gave religion staying power for people, culture, and society. That it really wasn't about what people believed, but what people did. So that's what they decided to change. So it was thus there was the aesthetics of Judaism that really needed to change and to be kept if it was really going to survive in the modern world. So the religion itself needed to be stripped down to its most basic elements if it was to survive. Jewish services needed to be stopped being said in, uh, in Hebrew or Yiddish, but needed to be said in German. The Bible and rabbinical literatures needed to be translated and read and said in German. Music and choirs needed to be present. Sermons needed to be said in German, and sermons needed to be a bit, needed to be about real social issues instead of about history. Men and women didn't need to segregate themselves by the sexes in synagogues. They could sit together. Wearing a kippah, uh, the religious skull cap or the yarmulke, should only be limited to wearing it in a synagogue. That you don't need it when you go out into the streets. Therefore, theology and dogma of Judaism needed to be simplified and distilled into moral and ethical values. So your actions and behaviors and how you treat your neighbors are really at the heart of Judaism. Really realizing that the Hebrew Bible and rabbinical literature is just products of men that are subject to change and biases, but the real words of God are what God is. God is love and God commands you to love your neighbors as yourself. So many of the reform ideas also abandon ideas about Jewish messiahism, our return to the Holy Land, or rebuilding a temple. Those are antiquated. We need to, to learn how to be productive citizens here and now. And you should focus on things that keep your Jewish identity, keeping kosher, celebrating religious festivals, keeping the Sabbath. So in 1810, Jacobson built a new type of Jewish synagogue dedicated to a new way of doing religion in Sessen, Germany that was committed to this new way of thinking and thus a new form of Judaism emerged known as Reform Judaism. So if you could only use one word to describe Reform Judaism, it's apropos to use words like liberal or progressive. And if you were to place and try to map Judaism along a spectrum, a line, you would put Judaism on the far left, or Reform Judaism on the far left of things. All of those descriptions would be true. Reform Judaism is quite liberal. It's quite left-leaning in its terms of its religiosities. If we could place a definition on it, I would say that Reform Judaism is a major branch of modern Judaism that emphasizes the evolving nature of Judaism and the superiority of ethical aspects over ceremonial ones. Reform Judaism is openly progressive, believing that women can be rabbis, that homosexuals are welcomed, that you are okay with questioning and even doubting the existence of God. The reasons for these beliefs are attributed to two basic ideas. One, progressive revelation. Progressive revelation means that revelation of the Bible and those given by God are not limited to back, are not limited uh, back to the biblical period and the time periods of the prophets. Rather, that revelation is continuous and ever evolving. The rabbis taught that the voice of God and the revelation ceased with the death of the last prophets, and that claims of Christianity and Islam are invalid because of the voice of God had ceased. But Geiger argued that all of Jews, all of the Jewish people are linked to a chain of revelation given to the prophets, and thus all Jews are capable of receiving new insights today because of our spiritual ancestry. So he believed in progressive revelation. Reform Judaism is also very influenced by the German philosophy, German idealism. Uh, German idealism was a philosophical movement during the Enlightenment, which emphasized the idea of oneself as a source of knowledge. 
and that the world, society, and cultures are products of the activity of the self. For Reformed Judaism, the shift occurred in the be belief in human's ability to understand itself and the divine as well as moral progression towards perfection. No longer are Jews living and doing halakha merely to please God and maintain the covenant. For Reformed Judaism, they believe you're doing halakha because you can literally change the world. This belief comes from Kabbalah, which we don't have time to talk about Kabbalah, which is a mystical form of Judaism. Um, but Kabbalah has this central theme and doctrine with it. Tikkum olam, which means to repair the world. That this is the purpose of Judaism. This is the goal of why God gave the covenant, is to repair the world. This is why Jews do halakha to repair the world. So reform Judaism is very centered on social justice, ethical behavior, right actions, the aesthetics of doing religion. The next group, Orthodox Judaism. So if we were to go back to that notion of modern Judaism as being on a spectrum, and like we said that reform Judaism would be placed on the left side of the spectrum, we would readily use characterizations like liberal and progressive to describe them. Orthodox Judaism would be the exact opposite, the mirror image of Reform Judaism. Orthodox Judaism is clearly on the right side of the spectrum. We would use words like conservative, traditionalist to describe them. If we were to give a definition of Orthodox Judaism, it would be a collective term for traditional and theological conservative branches of modern Judaism that is chiefly defined by regarding the Torah, both written and oral, as revealed by God, divine revelation. And while it's fair to say that both of these modern branches are reactions to the European Enlightenment, in truth, Orthodox Judaism is really a reaction to Reform Judaism. Judaism for much of its history was never fully unified and never really an autonomous group with no central governance for its religious traditions like Islam or Christianity. Well, you could say Islam, but for sure Christianity. Instead, Judaism has a vast number of localized communities with distinct traditions like the Ashkenazis, the Sephardic Jews that we kind of talked about. But with the establishment of the modern state and the modern government in Europe, it became clear that there became a need for organization and unification within the religious tradition. So you had men like rabbis like Raphael Cohen and Eleazar Fikulis that attempted to re uh, reinforce and create some kind of central authority in response to fears of deterioration of traditional norms in light of modernity. Both men and their communities ordered that men must grow long beards and cannot shave. Marry, that marry women are to wear head coverings and headgear. They forbid all Jews from interacting with non-Jews on any level. And that all men and women should wear simple made clothings and plain clothings of neutral colors, particularly black and gray. But everything came to a head in 1818 with an incident known as the Hamburg Temple Dispute in Germany. So this incident involved the construction of a new Jewish temple, uh, Jewish synagogue in Hamburg that would be dedicated to J Jacobson's ideas of reformed Judaism. But the construction causes a huge division within the Jewish community. The division became so public and increasingly bitter that it was dragged into civil courts where non-reformed Jews would win the appeal to prevent the synagogue from being built. But however, in 1878, the German government intervened and reversed previous court's decision, siding with reformed Judaism because reformed Judaism was very modern facing, whereas orthodox Judaism wasn't. This event served to draw lines within the, the Jewish community, those who favored reform practices and those who did not. And so those who do not become colloquially known as Orthodox Judaism. 
So concerning what Orthodox Jews believe, it's largely a continuation of what we've already talked about with rabbinic Judaism, but a very conservative aspect of that, particularly in relation to the modern world. Orthodox Jews do not believe in compromising their stance on halakha, Jewish traditions, customs, and values. They are strict monotheists and strictly follow the commandments, believing that the Bible and the Talmud are divinely inspired documents. Within Orthodox Judaism, there's also two prominent subgroups within them, the Haradim and Hasidic Judaism. So the Haradim or Hadari Judaism uh, refers to pra pra Jewish practices of the strictest kind, the strictest kind of Orthodox Judaism that there is. If Orthodox Judaism represents the right on the spectrum, the Haradim would represent the far right. We would use terms like fundamentalists to describe them. They follow Halakha so seriously that this actually happened to me when I was in Israel. They follow Halakha so Israel that if you mistakenly drive your car down the wrong street on Sabbath, your car will be stoned. They will throw rocks at your stone, breaking your windows and smashing them out. That is how seriously they take Halakha. The Haradim are characterized by their minimal engagement with modern, the modern world, as well as non-Jews. They censor all forms of education, communication, media, social media, the internet, seeing all of it as non-edifying works of the flesh and largely as non-beneficial for the fulfillment of Jewish life. Some of the Haradim uh, even see, the, see their fellow Jews as not being Jewish enough. And so don't even recognize reform, some reformed Jews as being Jews themselves. And they're even lukewarm to the existence of the state of Israel. Some of the Haradim reject the state of Israel outright, believing it shouldn't exist, arguing that it violates the covenant and the prophecies of the Bible. And they tend to side with the Palestinians during the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts. They will protest the existence of Israel. So it's interesting, Jews protesting other Jews for the existence of Israel. The Haradim are also typically labeled anti-Zionists because of that. Um, others see the state of Israel as an instrument of God to bring about his will on earth and upon all the Jews. And they're very anti-Palestinian. And so we'll talk about the, those Haradim later on. All boys and girls within the Haradim are sent to Yeshiva, which is a Jewish religious school, until the age of 13. Um, the majority of men continue to study in school. They go to a specialized school called the Kohel, which around 40% of the male population remain permanently unemployed because they study scripture and the Bible all day long. While a small minority are able to work, but the work that they do and the employment they have is very limited to roles and jobs that only serve the community. So like plumbers, electricians, carpenters, very basic stuff. Women do not continue any education beyond the age of 13. Uh, they also maintain gender segregation in public. They dress in black, modest, or navy colored clothing. Married women, uh, married men grow beards, but all men grow long locks on side their head uh, of hair called the peyote. Um, these sideburns that they grow out very long. The second group are the Hasidic Jews and refer to a religious group that originated in Eastern Europe particularly in Poland and Ukraine, uh, and that who arose as a spiritual revival movement within Judaism. Uh, the founder of this movement is Rabbi Israel ben Eliezer, or he's better known as Baal Shem Tov. Um, and he's the founder of the Hasidic Jewish movement. Um, Baal Shem Tov was a famous Jewish mystic and rabbi who was reported to have healings of power could heal people as well as doing miracles um the central teaching of of Balashim Tov is that jews are to have 
that Jews can and are to have a direct connection with God that he called devikut, devikut, which literally means the clinging to. So he believed that Jews could cling and have a, 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 a unique, special relationship with God. That he argued um, that this devikut was a kind of loving devotional worship to God. That man must worship God not only when they're practicing their religious acts, praying, but they do it in every aspect of their daily life. So walking about, you're worshiping God. Repairing somebody's toilet as a plumber, you're worshiping God. When you hold on uh, with the, when you're on hold uh, for with customer support for over a solid hour, you're worshiping God. You're when you're listening to this lecture, you're worshiping God. But Al Shatov believed that the laws and the commandments of the covenant are all about actions and living the right type of life, but living your life in a good, joyous, and holy life. So worshiping God was a way of living your life, and what worshiping God was halakha. So unlike the Haradim, Baal Shatov did not advocate for complete withdrawal from society, but rather to be visible and but visibly be seen worshiping God in everything you do. Um, Balashatov taught that the worst sin within Judaism was for a Jew not to be joyous and not to love others. Having no joy was blasphemy. Not loving was taking God's name in vain because God is love. God is joy. So much of the difference attitude that the Haradim have, Hasidic Judaism still is very conservative in its appearances and its commitment to religious purity. The only difference is, is their attitude of how they do religion. So, so you really couldn't tell the difference between the two. Hasidic Jews um, you know, would wear black, wear the special hats, have sideburns and stuff like that. But their attitudes, their interactions with you are completely different. So that's how you can tell uh, uh, <laughs> the difference between the two. Uh, and finally is um, the last modern branch that we want to talk about, conservative Judaism. And so after, uh, again, if we were to use the image of a spectrum here, if Reform Judaism is on the left, if Orthodox Judaism is on the right, the Haradim and the Hasidic are on the far, far right, uh, conservative Judaism would be smack dab in the middle. Conservative Judaism uh, would be character. You could use characterizations like words like moderate, centrist to describe them. Um, they're also um, outside of North America and the United States. They're also known as Masoret Jews. Um, M A S O R uh, T I Masoret Jews. Um, but conservative Judaism is what they're predominantly call. Um, and if we're to give a definition to conservative Judaism, it would be a Jewish movement that regards the authority of the Jewish law and tradition as uh, mediating primarily from the ascent of the people through the generations and traditions. So they give priority to tradition, and that's where authority lies, not so much in the Bible, but lies in tradition. Whereas Reform Judaism gives authority to ethical behaviors, Orthodox, to the Bible alone, Conservative Judaism would give to tradition. They would give tradition the upside. So, and while Reform Judaism and Orthodox Judaism are reactions to the European Enlightenment, Conservative Judaism is really a reaction to the infighting between Reform and Orthodox Judaism. Uh, conservative Judaism emerged out of the teachings and the actions of Rabbi Zacharias Frankel, uh, who uh, believed that reason based on scholarship, uh, from scholarship he means the Bible, from the Talmud, from Jewish tradition and history, must be used and considered when making any decision about faith and religion. He believed that Jewish tradition and history has a solution to modern problems but advocated caution when dealing with tradition and history. You got to use reason when interpreting those things. Throughout Frankel's life and career, he was routinely found himself being thrown into controversies, being asked to just choose sides between the debates between Reform and Orthodox Judaism, and Frankel will always and famously pick the middle. 
the middle position, the neutral position in every argument. So it made him a reputation. And because of this uh, neutrality, Franklin, uh, Frankel was appointed the head of a new Jewish seminary that was built, the first of its kind in Europe, at Brazil of Poland, uh, where he trained rabbis in his new middle way, which becomes conservative Judaism. But conservative Judaism really took root in the migration of Jews to the United States. And so conservative Judaism is the dominant form of Judaism here in the United States. Uh, and it really succeeded here because there was no pre-established Jewish communities and authorities. The debates between Reform Judaism and Orthodox Judaism didn't really make it here. So there was no need to pick sides. So people just stayed in the middle. It was also further aided by American Jews like Isaac Meyer Wise, who, even though he was very liberal and reformed Judaism in his thinking, he believed and practiced pragmatism. And he believed that it was more important for Jewish community to, to stay together and to grow together and not fragment as it was in Europe. So therefore, he advocated for compromise, advocated for the middle way. Even, it, even in his own practice, he was quite liberal. But the real impetus for the conservative movement to grow and be established in the United States came with, again, the establishment of another seminary here in the United States, the Jewish Theological Seminary of New York City in 1886, where the seminary would go on to train rabbis by the thousands and academics by the thousands who would promulgate this new form of the middle way, conservative Judaism. So it really emerged as an academic endeavor that trickled down to local congregations and became a denomination over time. As in terms of their religious beliefs, uh, again, conservative Jews are very in the center, but more so the right leaning center. They're conservative. They're strict monotheistic and believe in actively practicing halakha, but they're also open to modern interpretations. So an example of this is that conservative Jewish men will still wear kippahs all day long, even out in the public, but they wear modern clothing. Um, uh, they don't segregate women um, in their congregations. They might have a Jewish uh, a rabbi who's a female, things like that. So it's... It is quite liberal at times, but they're still very conservative in their beliefs. They're not as far as I would say as Reformed Judaism. The last thing that I want to talk about is the importance, because we have to talk about when we get to Judaism, is we need to talk about Zionism. So this is going to be the last section of the lecture here. Zionism refers to um, a national, excuse me, a nationalistic movement that espouses for the establishment of and the continual security and support of a homeland for the Jewish people. The term of Zionism uh, refers or it comes from the biblical Hebrew and it refers to a hill in the city of Jerusalem that would later be, become the symbol and symbolize and used metaphorically to refer to the entire land of Israel. That hill in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, was believed by the Jewish people to be the holy mountain of God, which later the temple was to be built. The roots of Zionism date back as far as the biblical period following the events of the exile and return of the Jewish people from Babylon, um, where you had people who returned from Babylon were seen in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah as those who were the ones who were the pure Jew because they had gone through punishment, they had gone through the exile. Those Jews who remained in, in Israel and who never left weren't to take part of the rituals and, and were seen as people of the land. So you have some of that Jewish nationalism there. It also stems from the Maccabean revolts from 170 to 140. Um, uh, BCE and throughout the Roman period. Um, Jewish nationalism is fundamentally tied to religious beliefs surrounding the covenant and that the land of Israel is a God-given inheritance of the Jewish people and the Jewish people are God's elect. You also see it in the following the Bar Kokhba revolt uh, that the Roman Emperor Hadrian uh, forbade uh, 
the Jewish people from living in the city of Jerusalem, renaming the territory Palestine, renaming the city Jerusalem to Aliyah Capitolina, and even rebuilding the temple or, or building a temple on top of the old ruins of the, of the Jewish temple to the Roman god Jupiter. So for about 500 or 1500 year period, um, uh, uh, um, after a, a 1500 year period, the Jews were largely forbidden from living in Jerusalem. But starting around the 16th century, things changed. So they were, you know, they weren't allowed to live in their homeland. But around the 16th century, a small number of Jews figured, uh, figures uh, attempted to lead movements to resettle their ancestral homeland. The earliest known example of the Sephardic Jew, uh, Jews that did this were people like Yehoa uh, Machias, who attempted to help Jews fleeing Portugal in the, in the 16th century uh, uh, to migrate to Israel with the help of, Turk, of the Ottoman Turks. Another example of this would be Sabatia Zevi in the 17th century, who claimed to be the Jewish Messiah and was reported to have performed all kinds of miracles and led to a religious pilgrimage of Jews to Jerusalem, many choosing to settle there permanently uh, until Zevi was captured by the Ottomans and forced to publicly convert to Islam. Um, but with the emancipation of the Jews across Europe, many Jews rejected the idea of a return to Israel, known as Aliyah, arguing that they should stay and invest where they live now. In 1845, Reformed Jew Jewish rabbis gathered across Europe at Frankfurt, Germany, and voted to remove language and sections from Jewish prayer books that spoke of hope and a return to Zion, a restoration of the Jewish state, or the reconstruction of a Jewish temple, arguing instead we need to focus on staying here. Again, be fully German here in the streets. Things that uh, Moses Mendelssohn argued for. Likewise, in the United States, in 1868, Jews met in Philadelphia and followed suit, voting to remove this language from their prayer books. Many Reformed Jews believed that the biblical prophecies had come true in places like the United States and Canada, that these places had become a new Zion for the Jewish people to live and thrive and survive. So there's no need for a return because God had provided them. But still, not every Jew was convinced. Not every Jew felt the same way, and some of them tried to create Jewish states where they could. So one of the most famous examples actually happened here in the United States with um, a Jew named Mordecai Noah, who was uh, an American ambassador uh, during uh, Jefferson's presidency, that he attempted to create a Jewish state between Canada and the United States in upstate New York, but it failed. So there's some examples, but regardless, the status of the Jewish people in Europe had dramatically changed. They were allowed to live normal lives. They were allowed to have normal religious traditions and their religious traditions were able to grow. But everything changed and came to a head with the influence and leadership of Theodore Herzl, the father of Zionism. So Herzl was an Australian Hungarian Jewish lawyer and journalist who became a political activist following the events of the famous Dreyfus Affair. So the Dreyfus Affair was a political and military scandal in France that occurred in 1894 and involved the false accusation and conviction of a captain um, named Alfred Dreyfus, a, a French Jew who was accused of being a French or uh, German spy. The, acquisi the accusation and subsequent trial captured the French nation and led to widespread anti-Semitism emerging and all Jews being labeled spies and, and public enemies of the states. Jewish homes and shops were vandalized by the French public. Jews were routinely beaten and killed by French mobs. Social and public services were being denied to the Jewish people and the French government actually encouraged this treatment of the Jews because they needed a scapegoat for the mismanaging of the armed conflict that they had with Germany at the time. 
It wasn't until 1906 that Dreyfus was publicly acquitted of all charges, and the French government officially made, uh, admitted that they made up all the evidence against Dreyfus, so he was innocent. But for Herzl, this was a revelation. This was a revelation uh, about the Jews' real place in Europe and, the, and, and in the world. That no matter how much the Jewish people changed to fit the, these societies they lived in, that they would truly never be accepted. Herzl reasoned that the Jews will never truly be accepted and safe in any country that they lived in, no matter how much they became productive citizens in accepted Western cultures, unless they have a nation of their own. So in 1895, Herzl published his famous book, um, Der Judenstaat, which means in German, the, Judens, the Jewish state, where he proposed that the, Jew, the Jews of Europe must leave and reestablish their homeland in Palestine, and that by having a Jewish state was the only secure way that the Jews will ever be safe and could avoid violence and anti-Semitism. And he's right to an extent, if you think about the history that subsequently follows thereafter. So in 19, or 1897, Herzl organizes the first ever Zionist conference or Congress in Basel, Switzerland, in which prominent Jewish leaders from all over the globe met for the sole purpose of organizing, fundraising, and petitioning for the creation of a Jewish state, first from the Ottoman Turks, but then later from the British government following World War I. The words and ideology of Herzl would encompass what Zionism was, originally was, and to some extent still is. It was a political ideology. At its core, Zionism sought to answer really only one question, how can the Jewish people be safe? And what the history of the Jewish people have always demonstrated is that they will always be persecuted, that they will always be marginalized, that they will always be subject to violence, if not genocide, regardless of what foreign land they found themselves. That is their history. Thus, the only way that the Jewish people can ever be safe is if they have their own country where they can run it, where they can live as the majority, where they can be protected, where they can have armies and fight back. So eventually, in 1947, the United Nations agreed and recommended that Palestine should be partitioned in two separate nations, a Jewish state for the Jewish people and an Arab state. And thus, two nations were born, the nation of Israel and the nation of Palestine. But with the creation of the modern state of Israel, Zionism also became religious in its ideology as well. With Jews actively returning and living in the promised land again, many Jews believe that the prophecies of the Hebrew Bible were being actively fulfilled before their very own eyes. These religious Zionists, also called Dayit, Dayitin, are religious nationalisms, and this goes back to our uh, uh, Haredim Jews who actually favor uh, Israel, this re religious Zionism, religious nationalism, uh, 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 combines the political elements of Zionism with Orthodox Judaism, particularly Haredi Judaism. The father of this ideology, the brainchild of this ideology, was Rabbi Abraham Isaac Kook. Uh, and he reasoned that, quote, Zionism was not merely a political and secular movement, but rather a tool created by God to promote the achievement of his divine scheme, to initiate the return of the Jewish people to their homeland and the land promised to the fathers to their fathers. God wants the children of Israel to return in order to establish a sovereign state, which Jews can live according to Torah and be ruled by God. Therefore, settling Israel is a religious obligation of every Jew. Helping the Zionists act 
in, in actualizing and manifesting the will of God on earth, end quote. So while not every Jew initially agreed with Rabbi Kutz's ideas or beliefs, but following the victories of the Israel of the Jewish people during the Arab-Israeli War, and then securing their existence as a state, it caused many Jews to believe and question: maybe God's will is being done, maybe the prophecies of the Hebrew Bible are being fulfilled. And the final nail in the coffin for religious Zionism to have a staying power within the religion of Judaism came following Israel's victory in the Six Day War in, in 1967, in which Israeli soldiers captured not only Jerusalem, but also the Temple Mount, and also expanded Israel's borders to what they were during the reign of King David in the Hebrew Bible. So capturing Jerusalem and the Temple Mount was significantly important. Because if you think about not since the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE, or really the Bar Kokhba revolt in, in, in uh, 135 CE, have the Jews controlled both. Having the Jews control of the Temple Mount meant that Israel could consider the option of rebuilding their temple thus fulfilling biblical prophecy. Furthermore, there's a parallel movement within Christianity called Christian Zionism, which actively and financially supports religious Zionism, but for completely different reasons, believing that these activities by the Jews will usher in the return for Christ and the fulfillment of Christian prophecies and New Testament prophecies, but they financially support them. So it, grow, it has a bigger problem and bigger mount and it grows into something that now is part of the fabric of living in Jerusalem and living in Israel and it's part of the fabric of that Jews have to deal with however the big problem with the goals of religious Zionism is that Palestinians live in these lands that religious Zionists want to occupy also the Al-Aqs Mosque the third most important religious site within the religion of Islam occupies a significant portion of the Temple Mount so religious Zionists propose that they just need to destroy the mosque and remove all Muslims from the land of Israel in order to purify the land religiously and rebuild the Jewish temple, thus bringing back the presence of God as it was during the biblical period. And it's these actions and these desires, these religious desires that still lead to conflict between the Jews and the Arab to this day. So why Zionism is extremely important. 